Welcome to the crowd to the uh, five o'clock budget work session. I'll just let you take over. I'll get the call. Oh, I'll to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I see they're both uh, buried in the curtains of the wood. All right, you want to run with it? Yep, I'll run with it. Um, so one, just want to give the uh, board just an update from last time. Um, I sent out an email earlier just to kind of give the board a, a heads up on everything. So again, if you remember last uh, budget work session on the 13th, um, up here is kind of the, the adjusting budget balance. We ended up with a $362,000 surplus. Today, we are showing a $2,100 deficit. Um, and basically the reason for that, nothing changed in any of the numbers below with exception of one small one. Um, but we got uh, updated um, numbers from the Commissioner of Revenue for personal property. And, a, a, and so you can see the personal property number decreased by 369,000 due to decrease in uh, values, taxable values. And we had a very slight increase. I think it was about $5,000 in real estate, some additional real estate. And then one only really small, small change was under the schools. There was a number transposed in the request. Previously, we had 340,682. The request was actually 340,862. So it was a $180 difference yep. just to be completely transparent. So, so where we stand right now is the $2,100 deficit with everything else that the board included uh, at the last work session. Um, so, I mean, depending on where the board wants to go from here, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions. I'm happy to show you things. If the board said we want to be done with it right now, then, you know, we could make up $2,100 and adding some additional revenue. But like I said, I'll, I'll pass it over to, to the board members. Gentlemen? I think there's places where there's cuts can be made to give us a little bit of edge room. Yeah, um, well, one of the <coughs> things that Eric and I talked about this morning was, uh, you know, we, I guess what last time we decided uh, just to put fully funding the insurance in there. Yes. 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 Chris Tony. Um, I think that'd do, be a good place to probably start the conversation. Yeah. Now, Eric said that. He originally, when he put 6% in there, that you originally thought it was going to be around 8%, right? Correct. I put 6% anticipating an 8.5% increase. And each percent is how much? Uh, roughly 22000 Okay. Um, hey, you, hey, you, right there, sir. Right there, sir. Yeah. So this is... Right here is with the 100% covering up to 11%, correct? What we have here? Yes, correct. Yeah, what you have in the budget right now. And, and, and honestly, there's been, since my budget proposal went out, there's been some just slight tweaks <coughs> in the numbers, but each 1% is roughly around 24,000. 24? Yeah, it's around 24,000. But, but yes, I mean, so what is in the budget right now fully funds the health insurance. Okay, and you gave us some options last week. Yeah, I can um I can pull um option number 5. Um Yeah, so again, so th that screen just kind of outlines, you know, kind of some of the the options that were proposed. Again, option 1 or option 2 is County pays all, employees pay all, and then three, four, and five is something in between. But they're all roughly, you know, there's not a whole lot of huge difference in the overall cost. I mean, certainly there's some differences um, from individ individual plans, um, 
But yeah. And w- w- option five, uh, you know, you would you know, kind of made that as a recommendation for yourself. That looks like about a $69,000 difference between the fully funding. What is, what is the, op- the option five there? Um, I, I remember that one was a little more nuanced than the other ones. So option five, I mean, basically there's, you know, minimal, there's a small savings for HDHP, but then there's a slight, slight increase for employee only. And then it's, um, you know, goes up a little bit based upon the cost, um, as you see for, for dual versus family plans. And, you know, um, from a dual plan, well, let me start with family. I mean, I'm sorry, start with single, you know, you could go down five dollars if you're on an HDHP preventative, or the maximum is you go up eleven dollars on a KA five hundred comprehensive um, dual. You know, these are monthly amounts. Um, the, the numbers in this red box are monthly amounts. Dual um, Lois's would go up twenty six dollars a month, um, and the highest is if you wanted to be on the comprehensive KA five hundred right here going across. It would be a $50 a month increase. And then the family plans, um, again, the lowest HDHP is a $43 a month increase. And the highest would be is if you're on a KA500 comprehensive family plan, it would be $79 a month increase. Do we have any statistics or not statistics, but estimations on what that would look like comparatively speaking with, with the COLA factored in, I mean, take home pay, just real rough estimate. Yeah. Let's, I mean, let's just say, um, I don't have take home, but let's just say for instance, let's use maybe what is probably a lower end salary. Let's just say $35,000 okay. as a, as a low end. That's probably close to maybe the lower of what someone would be making times 3%, that's 1,050 um, versus, I'm sorry, times 12, if you are, the highest if, if, if that employee has the highest plan of the family plan, that's 948. So their COLA would offset or would cover their, I should say that's not an increase, they're, they're neutral, they're they wouldn't make any money. Correct. They'd be, they'd the, their neutral. COLA is offsetting the, the, the insurance. Oh, so the three percent would be what fifteen hundred, and then seventy nine times twelve increase would be nine forty eight. Yes, seventy nine times yeah twelve is nine forty. So there'd be there'd be some. Uh, I guess my my thought would be the last thing you want to do is give people a raise and they're taking home less money because of health insurance. Um, that would be my main concern there. At the, and that's at the smallest value with the highest uh, additional premium. That person would still at least be making what around 550 more dollars at the lowest pay rate. So your biggest amount of people are in that single um, K 500 plan. Yeah. If you look, if you look to the columns right here, this shows how many people uh, are in each individual plan. And so you have the most people employee only 62 in the KA, KA 500 comprehensive. The next amount is 33 11. for dual Come KA 500 on. comprehensive for dual and then 31 for KA 500 comprehensive family. So those are, those are kind of the numbers for how many people are in each plan. So for, for the 62 on the, what would the, we'll do the five, that would be 50. That would be 130. So that'd be 11 two. times. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear so that. So the that'd KA be... 500 comprehensive plan for a single person, $11 a month times 12 months is $132 for the year. Correct. They would be about 1350 $13. $13. $13. $13. $13. $13. $13. $13. $13. $13. $13. $13. $13. plus from this year. Yeah. Both of your workers are pro lower end people are probably in that mm-hmm. because yeah. they probably are two uh, working households and they're on their own insurance mm-hmm. because you can't ride on your spouse's one. Right. <clears throat> so you do you know just it came up the um, the change in the personal property that Eric emailed about and so we were just talking about. Well, I think one of the things that's going to happen with that change in the personal property. Without lowering the rate, people are going to get a ten percent tax decrease. And I think that's part of the pro- part of what happened is the rate instead of used cars jumping twenty percent like they have the last two years, yeah. when we lowered the rate, now they're going the other direction. 
So even if we stay at 410, you're the tax it's, a, cut. it's a 10%, it's a 41%, 41 cent, basically. The only people might get a tax cut would be those who bought a new car, like me. Yeah, and but you're not paying on it unless you bought it before January 1. Exactly. So if you didn't buy it before January 1, you don't have to pay on it. Yeah, me and the commissioner have, have had a, you know, I mean, good that, conversation that, that's, yeah, that, it's bad news, but it's good news. Because yeah. instead of going the wrong, crazy direction, it's starting to come back down to earth, I guess. It's best way. <clears throat> yeah. I'm thinking we won't see as much on Facebook about how it went down as we did when it went up that we... Well, you never did. I mean, yeah. you know, people like to get on Facebook and beat your chest. Yep. I mean, and again, I mean, certainly, you know, if the board says we want to be at a certain dollar amount, we can back into a different plan if that's what the board wants to be at. Uh, just remember, so... So next week we have a, a budget work session to be determined. And we would probably, again, if we don't make some decision today, which, you know, maybe there's more information coming next week. I'm not sure. Um, you know, we would just have to make this, a decision on the insurance, what the board selects by um, April 1st. So we'd have to have a budget work session next week and the board would have to take action on a health plan if they don't select something today, which is fine. Like I said, if the board doesn't see something they want, if they want me to back into something based upon a dollar amount, then I could, I could do that as well. I can just tell you my opinion on it is we sat here over the last couple of weeks and said, we don't think we make enough money at all these. And we'll talk about doing a salary study. Then when we give a raise, if, if we have the ability, and I think we still have the ability, even with the bad numbers from the commissioner, to do everything that we said. Now, I, I say we cover it, and that's just me, because I am not real big on saying, here it is, but there it goes. Yeah. I mean, and I'm not, we don't have to raise taxes to do that. Like I said, we're not raising them if we leave them the same. You're still getting a 10 percent discount or rebate. Well, I shouldn't say 10 percent because you don't know for sure exactly what it is across the board, but yes. I, I'm gonna guess it's probably somewhere in that range. There's no uh 750 plan, or it's still just a 500 and 1000. 500, 1000 HDHP. But pro, so a couple of years ago, again, we had the 250, 500. And HDHP a couple of years ago to start to try and you know lower the cost. We we got rid of the 250 plan and now we have the 500, the 1000, and the HDHP. And that's pretty comparable to what a lot of localities are doing too. That's those are some of the typical plans that they have. Yeah, you know, my argument in the past has been, you know, that that the people that are affected the most are the ones who are also uh making moves. Well, I mean, some of them are, but they're also getting the the family plan um, where they have the highest increase, which, you know, is a higher burden for them for sure, but it's a higher cost for the county as well too. And, um, you know, so some of the tough decisions that employees may have to make is, you know, do I stay inside a 500 plan or do I go to a thousand plan? And I, I, you know, I don't know if we ever considered or, and or maybe we thought and talked about it. Maybe it's not possible as to, you know, some sort of like self insurance pool because you got to assume that, you know, the the five hundred versus a thousand. What would that number look like if the county chose to pay that out versus the savings that the county would have in a worst case scenario? It seems like probably even out in my opinion. But that's maybe something HR could look at. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean. The I mean, the county was self-insured previously, right. um, you know, back in 20, we, we left being self-insured, I want to say it was 2013, and Ms., I'm looking at Ms. Gillum, because we were with Gateway back when it was around. And I, and I know self-insured can mean a lot of different things. I'm just sort of really talking about that differential between the $500 and $1,000 in terms of what does that look like, you know, because if you assume that you have, well, I mean, here we've got. 150 employees or 100, you know, 40 employees on a 500 plan, and we only have 10 or 15 employees on a thousand plan. You know, but if you look at the premium differential between, you know, for the county, you know, between a, you know, 
1,000 and 200 for the most expensive, it's, you know, almost a hundred and $80 savings per employee per month, right? So it's a 900, you know, it's, it's a thousand dollar savings per employee per month. So let's just take that bottom line. You got $31,000. What's the probability that you're going to use up $31,000 of the use of a deductible? I, I don't know the yeah. answer to that, you know, I almost never go to the doctor, so I don't use my deductible very often, right? But other people might. So Chris know. is using his for his knee right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> almost day off the scooter. Well, he's gonna blow. He's gonna blow past his deductible. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so <clears throat> my the only thing I want to throw out there is that, um, and I, Mr. Sheridan, your point, I agree. It, it, saying, hey, it happens to me all the time when, when you know, we're looking at giving someone, the teacher a raise at FUMA and then you turn around, the health insurance goes up and they're back to where they were. So I, I totally understand that. Um, I, I don't think it's always a wash necessarily. I think even at, a, at the lowest salary, at the, the lowest salary at the highest um, rated plan, they're still coming out somewhat ahead. Um, and that goes up more as, the more the person makes. Um, so I guess my thought process is there were some conversations last week about some additional things we wanted to take a look at. Granted, that was before we became above the line, uh, before that number turned red plus about $2,000. Um, there were some things with the, the clerk's office we were talking about. Sheriff's office. Sheriff's office that we were talking about. Realistic, if, realistically, if we want to keep the tax rate level, and I'm not saying someone doesn't want to go down or come up, but hypothetically, if all five of us said we want to keep the tax rate level, we would have to make a decision about switching to option five for the health insurance if we wanted to even have a conversation about funding some of those other things that we were taking a look at. So my thought with visiting this option five would be that it does free up $69,000 for us to look at other things that we could potentially fund. Um, I think that would if we went this route, it would cover what the clerk of court is asking for, for her folks. And I think it would cover the um, promotion and salary increases that the sheriff is asking for to, to the tune of 11,000, I think it was, something like that. I know it was total 120 because that included two new positions. Um, so that that was just my-, my Maybe get that shed for Aaron as well too. What's that? Maybe get that shed for Parks and <laughs> Yeah, yeah. She's a well, uh, uh, one of the things that I'm going to bring up, do you want me to go back to the main sheet or do you want me to stay here? I think you can leave this. Okay. Yeah. But before we start talking about taking away and stuff of that mm -hmm. nature, we haven't talked about a meal tax. And that's something that we as a board can implement in November, I believe. Correct? Yep. Right. We could and implement that in November. <laughs> yeah. And if we started a meal tax, that's not trying to tax and tax and spend. That's saying this is something that everybody around us does. Every time we eat in another county, we help bear their tax burden. How about Marlon Charlotte? So will just raise theirs. All of them. I mean, I'm telling you, like I said, I bought a sandwich for $8 and paid $9. And a good portion of that was meal tax. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I'm not trying to come up with new stuff, but that's something so that we can have – What's your phrase, Mr. O'Brien? So you can be competitive with the well, and, and so, so we're not an just leaving lever, it just right? on so these we, two. You know, as opposed to most counties, we don't have as many levers as they do. And on these two, personal levers. property and real estate, the only people paying those are people that live there. If that makes sense. My thought on the meals tax is, in essence, it is still going to be paid for mostly by the people who live here. It's, it's to me, it's like hiding a tax. Um, we don't have a lot of tourism. Most people eating here are the people we know. If I, when I go in the restaurants around the lake, I know the majority of the people that are in there. Those are the people who would be paying this tax, which are the people who live here. There's a ton that come in DWs that don't. Yeah. And you and, have to remember and if, if we open up anything at Zion's Crossroads, hopefully we'll be drunk. I'm not, like I said, I'm not trying to do to the taxpayer what I just talked about not doing to the employee. Yeah. This is just another tool in our toolbox that I, how many years ago was it we tried to do? Five, 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 five years five, ago. And it, it was my idea. Yeah. And, and we had three votes for it on the board. And if we'd have waited six months, 
we wouldn't have had to go to referendum. Now, yeah. the people did say no, but in every county that's ever put it up, it's always failed the first time. And I think if we do that, we also say, let's dedicate 1% of that. Just off the top of my, head. my counter to that is, your real estate and personal property tax is 100% Fluvanna County people. Your meals tax will not be 100%. That's what I just said a second ago. And your personal property and real estate, you don't have a choice. You need a house. You need a car. The people who eat out, that's a personal choice. So they make the choice if they want to engage with that tax. I will, I will, I will counter that and say – from the business perspective, you know, I go into sales every Saturday. It's my cheat day. I get myself a mini cheese pizza and go home and take a long nap. Right. <laughs> um, but I talk to Rosario a lot when I'm in there and the price of food has continuously gone. I mean, he, he, he said what he used to be spending $2,000 on per month. He's spending 6,000. So I don't necessarily think you also have to look at it from the citizen perspective yes there is a choice but there is no choice for the business owner who is inevitably going to again increase his prices in the face of inflation and the things that the, the cost of food prices and things that are going on right now and that's going to eventually be passed on to the the, the consumer so they're going to then it's going to cost even more to go out to eat and what if people i mean i you know what if people what if, what if it in turn hurts businesses, which then robs Peter to pay Paul because less people are going out to eat and there's less sales. But the meals tax, unlike Europe where it's a value added tax, your sales tax and your meals tax is not appearing on the menu. The price on the menu does not include sales tax or meals tax. It's a pass through tax. So yes. In other words, they're not, they're not, it's not coming out of the business owner's pocket. He's just charging you for the tax and he's got to. He's got to remember it. Yeah, just like the sales tax. You know, they do anyhow. Um, uh, so they do that for regular sales tax because they got to pay that on the regular sales tax, not on the meals tax. So that it's it's a it's just a pass through. It's immediate. But if we raise it three cents, then it's three cents that's collected from the individual per dollar. You also, I think, when you look at who's actually being taxed by it, yeah, some of us might be homeowners, some of us might be renters. Some of us might be guests of renters. Some mm -hmm. of us might be, you know, the kids of, of, of homeowners, right? So there's a lot of other people that pay into that tax. And as, you know, just in, in the case of Wawa alone, you know, that could easily add up to a significant sum of money. So I don't know that you're, you're hiding a tax, uh, as Mr. Fairchild put it. Um, it. It's a tax that most people are used to paying. It's just now a tax that we're employing right here that, again, allows us you know, to be, you know, more competitive with surrounding counties because they have the same tax. And so, you know, when people say, well, why is your, you know, real estate tax rate so much higher than everybody else? Well, because they use four other taxes that we don't use. You know, if we had those four taxes, maybe, maybe it would be a little bit more competitive. But if we don't have those, then we face the choice of saying to ourselves, well, you know, we really don't want to put out a tax increase. We don't think the people are looking for that right now, you know, but we also don't want to not provide for these core services or for these improvements here. And so we end up with these struggles. Whereas, you know, the practical reality is what's the right thing to do in order to stay competitive as a county across the board. You know, for me, the meals tax is a pretty straightforward. Yes. You know. To me, it's just a, it's just another another tax, and and we're where we have the option to not spend as much, such as not paying for one hundred percent of the insurance. Instead, we're going to tax the people, and I just don't. Um, I mean, at, at NFS, we deal with that, of course, every year. Um, insurance rates going up, and you know, people get people get raises, and people get. Uh, sometimes they get to pay more on insurance and the taxpayers are I'd say the majority of them are experiencing the same and ultimately we're that's who that's where the money's coming from so we're going to raise taxes on them so and they're having the same types of increases at, at their work so and bringing that up, Mr. Sheridan, I, I, I assume, or was it Mr. O'Brien? I think it was you that brought it back brought up it just, up. Back, yeah. just now. Um, it, it would seem to me that it would be, and we got into this a few weeks ago, that it would be so, somewhat speculative if 
you thought you had three votes for a meals tax, are you suggesting that we should include that in the potential revenues? I'm saying we have to think about that one. But I'm also going to talk about, I don't think we can, can we? We'll talk. I mean, we, we haven't passed it yet. We can't include. Well, we did that with the rate fees for for applications I mean, and stuff like that. You could. You would be. You would be somewhat speculative if you didn't do it. You'd you fund it out of fund balance. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Part of the years. So. Yeah. It would only. Yeah. You'd only. Well, have to you'd only be looking at. No, I know. I mean, I'm sorry. I, 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 I mean, honestly, I would. Um, well, here's another one. That well, I that would say no more good. than three hundred thousand. Well, you bring yeah. fund balance brings up a good point. I mean. It's already tax money that people have paid, and it's there. I mean, Sorry, I missed that. What was that? My, um, is what? And again, I'm not saying this is where I'm at, or, or but someone brought up fund balance. I mean, if we were going to speculatively say meals tax, meals tax doesn't pass, then we pay whatever you know is there out of fund balance. Is fund balance something that we could use to say, hey, you know, within the budget, we want to do this, but you know. Because I guess my thought process is, is if you're, if you're going to turn around and tax people on meals tax in order to fully cover what we're talking about here in this conversation, there's money out there that they've already paid in taxes that it could be used for rather than turning around and tax. And I get that I get that the meals tax is a larger conversation to have about more than just this particular discussion. Yeah, the, the use of fund balance to reduce the tax rate during budget season is generally not a good idea. It's no. not something that you want to get in the habit okay. of doing. Um, I mean, I'm not saying it hasn't happened, but it's generally, you know, not considered the best way to go about doing it because it is a sort of a one-time right. hit and it's taking it away from, you know, your piggy bank, which in theory you're putting aside for CIP projects. Yes. I mean, if our CIP projects were all fully funded and everything was running perfectly fine, then you could argue that that might be a good way to go about it, but you don't know. And I remember a few years back when the economy took a real sour turn and the Virginia government was wondering whether they were going to pay their bills or not. And that's when the fund balance comes into play as far as that goes. So, you know, it's, it's not a, it's not a game you want to play. Now the difference between $50,000 out of fund balance, right. because we do the meals tax or don't do the meals tax. That's kind of pretty small. If, if you were going to quote, make that based on the way the numbers are happening here, but that's uh yeah, and to say that that's in general, we do avoid it. Well, I've got another another spot I brought up the last meeting. And how much do we have in there for the fire chief position? Uh, 100K, about 100, 110. I was going like to say that. probably more than that when you add in everything, because if we're going to hire somebody, you probably going to have to pay somebody. It so might be more, it might be 120. I, I, think I would 120. have 120. Right. There's a, if we don't do that, and I've been a proponent of doing it, but I also know this is a lean year. And this is one of those things where there's 120,000. How much did you say it was for the insurance and the sheriff's department? The, uh, yeah. or you, did you mean the clerk's request? And so the clerk's request. Yeah. I, mean, I, I think it was. The clerk was 44,000 yeah. and some yeah. change. Uh, the sheriff's well, and, and and the sheriff's was to the tune of two forty five. But if you break that down, there's there is an eleven thousand line item in there, if I recall, for for two positions for two positions to have sergeant, sergeant yeah. and lieutenant. Yeah, which when you're talking competitive, and you know you at least give those individuals the opportunity, and, and you take us. It might be a small hit, but I mean, if 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 getting those people where they should or, or the sheriff would like to see them be, and that helps retention, then all of a sudden you're having less of a supply issue because you don't have quite the turnover issue. So that was my only thought process. I mean, I know, two, what is it? Two, keep losing it. 245 is way bigger than what we're talking, but what was the one position? I think I saw it in my budget book. So, well, I mean, for the sheriff's department, it's, 83032 for one position. Now that's just the position. And then down below, there's all of the all of the equipment and other stuff that right. goes with one position. And so I was talking about the promotions, I guess. That was oh, the, per the yeah. promotions, those are eleven eight fifty three. That's that's it. So 
was I guess my point there was if you if you look at the 69 that you would be saving you're you know looking at two departments that have made requests and say hey we may not be able to do everything but we can can help you out a little bit I, my only thing is that I'm trying to suggest is that it gives us more flexibility if we don't want to raise the tax rate which I don't that it gives us flexibility to scratch some other itches if we look at if we were to look at option five and I not like I pointed out with the dropping of Kelly Blue Book if we keep the rates the exact same, it's a tax decrease. Right. But, and what I'm saying is, is that if we're all comfortable being flat, okay. Um, and I don't know where everybody's at. I know I'm, I'm the only thing I'm super not comfortable is coming above. Okay. But if we're all comfortable being flat, my point being is if we look at option five for the health insurance, it allows us to scratch two other itches that came up last week. It was just simply just throwing it out there that we could look at two of those things. And we talked about, you know, we had the constitutional officers in front of us a few weeks ago and and, and, and a lot of them talking about, you know, retention and, and trying to keep folks. And um, here we have two of them with requests out there that could be funded if we were to go a different way on something else. Maybe it's not from health insurance. Maybe it's from something else. I, I, I don't know. Um, I think, I, um, and, I, and, and we've talked about this so many times over the years about, you know, basically the health insurance and the impact of it. Um, you know, I've, and we, you know, as you know, I've been sort of a proponent of there is a percentage that the employee pays. Um, and, the, you know, that's, that's not been the way we've kind of done. We've kind of adjusted to try to meet where somebody is in the middle and made a lot of changes. And there's a lot of work that goes into that. And I think it's, you know, done it with the right intention, but, if you basically told employees, you know, you're going to pay 5% of your employee costs and you're paying your family costs, you know, then that's what they know they're going to get at that point in time. Um, and then every year that happens now, some years, and maybe we cap it, but some years, for example, we might have a 14 or 15% health insurance increase. And then we wouldn't be talking about, you know, a hundred or two, what is it? $206,000. We might be talking about $400,000 you know, $350,000. And so what do you do then? You do the same thing, absorb it in, you know, okay, that's, that's, that's a significant amount that you're absorbing in at that point in time. So to me, there's an aspect of creating a consistency for the employee that they understand that, yes, it's a benefit, but it's not going to vary too much. And they can expect that they're going to have, and I'm not saying 5% is the right number, but they can expect that a certain percentage is going to be coming out of their pocket as the health insurance premiums come up. I think I Mr. About that 80, 20 year old. I think Mr. Sheridan has a good point there. If we have a hundred thousand wedge in there for a fire chief it, with no intention of any time in the near term doing it, take the wedge out, give us the hundred thousand, make the line go green, fund the items that Mr. Goad likes, and we can still stay flat. It's well, one way to do it. Insurance. Yeah. You're saying fully fund insurance. Yeah. It's another way to do it. And then the citizens still get their tax break because of the lower valuations. We're not going to set the tax rate tonight. No. But we have to come up well, with a number. Well, that we is are our set the yeah, we, we have to rate. come up with our high point. Yeah. Yes. And the problem is just coming on, I thought we were going to be able to come out and just say the same numbers we have to say flat and then yeah. go down. But Kelly Blue Book kind of did that for us. If it makes sense. If that makes sense. But we set the tax rate after the hearing in the regular meeting, right? No, no, just to advertise. The action to advertise a tax rate and a budget gets set at the rate at the six o'clock meeting. Yeah, that's so what I the thought. only thing we don't want to do is set a tax rate. Too you know, low. Let's too low. Let's say they all of a sudden they came out and said, whoops, we made a mistake and we missed a million dollars, right? Or yeah. or, or uh, three hundred and fifty thousand. Then we gotta we gotta pay that out of fund balance. One penny. Uh, just advertising. It's 300, yeah. Yeah, 370. And <clears throat> so uh, that's the only thing I'm saying. That's one thing that we have to we have to think about right now is, yes, I I, I, I came to y'all and I was so excited. I thought we were going to be able to do all that other stuff. The numbers didn't come out quite exactly right, but we're still going to be able to stay flat. Well, I think there's general consensus that we can accomplish these things you know, uh, uh, across the board. I mean, I suspect if you want to take a vote on these, you know, two or three things that we're talking about right now, you'd probably get three votes one way or another, right? Yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't know that 
there's a lot of hand wringing necessarily going on about this at this point in time. We don't have to decide it, and we may have some better news that comes out that says, okay, well, we can do this. To me, it's a conceptual aspect of, you know, what we have this conversation about health insurance every year. Conceptually, you know, I, I think that we should come to some sort of place where we say this is the formula that we're going to use going forward. I think we have enough options, enough roads in front of us that we can take to get to the same objective. That is just which path we take. We're, like what you said, Mr. O'Brien, three of us, let's go down this road and, you know, maybe it forks and diverges back. But I think we have options and where they, everyone can and, come out a winner. And is this a, is this a will the will the assessment increases occur mid year? No, no, that's no, that's the next budget year. Yep. I don't know if we got that half year. Benefit. Next, no. next year is the one. Yep. No, we get the half yep. year. Benefit. Yeah. Next next year is the one. This is the lean year. Next year, we'll be able to sit here and talk about a equalized rate, or we can lower the tax rate. Yeah. Um, but that, that would be my only suggestion is I wanted to come in here and say the exact same ones. If we do that, there's not margin for error. So if a mistake is made, we got to find, we got to cut places. If I can give the board just one update to just about CIP really quick. I know there was a discussion about some of the CIP items. I did speak to the representative from one of the um, Pierce, Pierce uh, today. Um, and, and basically to quote him as, what did he say? To sum it up, basically, it would be impossible to guarantee that the trucks are going to make be able to make it under that price. He's like, right now, they're planning out trucks two years from now. And he's like, by the time those trucks come in, that's going to be into that that new EPA standard. He's like, there's a few, few um and when I use the word with them, like some cookie cutter or almost demo things that are ready to go at some point. He's like, those are even few and far between at this point. He's like, he's like, it's, it's, it's very unlikely that you're going to meet that, that EPA cutoff right now. Yeah. And I, did you give an update on this? I don't really. I have not yet. Oh, no. Are you going to give an update on this? Uh, I, I can. I was just. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Be, being aware of time hey. too. We, we got a close just, session. This, we need is to do. this is a the Tony two minute Brian. conversation here. Hey. Yeah. Where, where'd you go? Oh, no, we lost it. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> So I, I think it's always important when we are in, looking at the tax rate that we have some historical perspective. And uh, uh, the, you know, the, the historical perspective would be that if you just adjusted for inflation, the tax rate that we had back in, what was the year, 1978? Is that what you have there? Yep. Um, that if all you did was just adjust for inflation, it would be a tax rate of two dollars and sixty-five cents, or almost two eighty, or something like that. It's two seventy-eight. Two seventy-eight. Two eighty. Um, so when people think that their taxes have been skyrocketing, and you put it in that perspective, I think it's a little different. Um, your house certainly in nineteen seventy-eight didn't cost four hundred thousand um, dollars. You know, your car didn't cost fifty thousand dollars. So it's it's a it's an important note when we sit there and we struggle and say, oh my gosh, do we have to raise taxes this year? Well, sometimes you have to raise taxes to do the right things. So I just leave it at that. It's, it's also I was saying to Mike um, Goad, you know, we, we we talk about well, you know, if we can flat rate it this year, and but it's all one, you know, the, the, the taxpayers remember the past year when it was an incredible increase. And um, so I don't see, I don't look at it just what do we do this year? I look at it and how we're trending. And I think it's pretty, which I know everybody agrees after the increase last year, I think it's pretty important. So um, relief this year, I think those two go together. I mean, the one thing I'll say to that is uh, I bring up my class I took, and I'm not going to call out the county, but they gave us a budget that we had to prepare. And the first thing I did was look at them and say, all right, tell me what the equalized tax rate is. 
We don't talk about that very much. They all keep their tax rate the exact same. So we do a great job of letting our constituents know. Here's what the equalized rate is. Yes. And we don't have fluff built in ours. You know, we can't, we're not charging 84 cents and living off a 77 cent budget and pocketing seven cents of excess. And other counties, I hate to say that, are doing that. Most of them do that. But most all of them do that. That's why they're able to stay at that exact same rate all the time. I mean, I talked to the guy that was putting the thing on. Their real estate went up higher than ours. They were going to cut their rate, rate by one penny. The equalized rate was 14 cents lower. Charlottesville and Albemarle. And they were pocketing $30 million. And yeah. I was like. Yeah, Charlottesville and Albemarle assess every year. Right next door. So every year they just assess and pretty much they come in. Sometimes they still raise the tax rate a little bit. But for the this part, year they're God, raising the tax God rate. Uh, and I'm not dollar. trying to badmouth Louisa, but their stays the exact same, right? Yeah. Yeah, they're raising their stays the exact same. But that's because they had a 15% increase last year in their tax rate. Well, and they got businesses too. I'm just looking at the real estate side of it. If they kept it at 72, that was 15% increase in their tax rate. And I, and last I, year. I, think, I think we went up 5%. I think. To Mr. Fairchild's point, I mean, yes, you can look at it and say, okay, what is the burden? And I don't recall us raising taxes that much last year, but. Uh, it went from what, 77 to 84? So you went up 10 to 11 percent. I, no, I, I think you're I think Mr. Fairchild's close. I don't I think, I, I don't he, I think he is because exactly. with the tax, the real estate assessments went up like 12. But yeah. seven cents of 77 yeah. is oh, okay. 10 cents. Okay. 11. Right. Yeah. So we went 10. up 10 percent, but we didn't go up 15 percent. No. Like our neighbors did. You know, people look at us, go, oh, you raised the taxes <clears> because we educated them about right. where the equalized rate was. Everybody else just left it the same. But ultimately, the Nirvana goal would be you set a sustainable rate, you know, and, you know, that sustainable rate is something that you can count on and look forward. Maybe you make some tweaks every once in a while, but for the most part, it's just a sustainable rate that's meeting the goals of the county. I mean, well, we're, I'm, I'm going to ask the school board, but I, I got a letter from one of our constituents and he's like, you know, stop doing something with solar. <laughs> You know, he used a more colorful phrase than that. Mm. Um, and uh, he said, yeah, have you looked at the schools? Do you know how terrible shape these schools are and mold coming from the ceilings? The fields are a joke. You know, uh, it's an embarrassment. How do we stand in comparison to the other counties? Uh, you know, we're going to have to deal with a new school probably pretty soon. We've got a 50, 60-year-old plus school that is uh, not in the best shape, two of them. We've got, you know, these kinds of challenges facing. And so when you look ahead, if you don't want to repeat what we did in 2012, you got to plan for that, right? You know, I used to joke with Mr. Weaver all the time and said, you know, so everybody's complaining about the new tax rate increase that came because of schools. But how much money were you saving in advance to pay for those schools? You know, not at all. None. Well, none if you look at the tax right? rate right there, if it just stays at 63 or 64 cents, but we dropped it to 48, we dropped it to 50. Then you could have put money away. And the one I looked at, guys, is 78, 79, 80, and 81. Goochland did the exact same thing when they built their school. There's a monstrous tax increase right there. And I'm not saying we increased taxes monstrously. But for three years, people bit the bullet so we could pay off the new high school. Yeah. And and, as far as the new now the old high school, well, current it, it, high school our high school yeah i think a lot of the no 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 i mean no the one out of 50 oh yeah and it's either here or there to, to what we're doing now but the concerns that i heard was more from the cost than um than people having to see a tax increase it was just the amount of it. i mean it opened up what year did we open up that school 2000 2000 but we signed it was, it was 11 or 12 that's oh, 11 yeah, yeah. We opened it up back then, but the tax rate never increased because they just paid the interest. I thought they were talking about mothballing it, but I didn't realize that they had already opened it up when they were talking about mothballing. 
Yeah, ben was like my daughter, my daughter was there the first year that it opened. My so. son was there the first he did a sophomore year grade. there, yeah. so she was in eighth grade when it first opened. Or that were the I don't know. I think they're freshmen. Yeah, it, it was so eleven or twelve. 12 yeah. <laughs> Whichever year yeah. it was, uh, and, and I'm not I'm not here to throw stones, but I think we're going to be really close to flat level and do what we want to do. And I think the meals tax is just something that down the road, if we do that in November, well, that's another tool in our tool chest. And it's not, like I said, it's, I'm not trying to, there's nobody that eats more times at EWs than me. I, I promise you that right now. In the state of Virginia, there's nobody that eats there unless it's Wade. And that's because he owns it. I mean, it's just one of those things. I just, on the meals tax, I think it's too far out for us to start thinking about that in regards to this. There's a lot of compensation to be had. Um, I think we need to be cognizant of time also. Yeah. We need to have a quick close session, get well, back, do some items. And well, and two, whatever we do, we're going to need for, for the finance folks, whenever this is done, they're going to have to plug in all the numbers and get all the things ready to go still for the, for the so meeting. I, I would recommend that we play it safe and put a one cent increase over what we're currently looking at. So where are we at? 80, 84, 84, 4, 4, 4. Or just do 85, 85 5. 5 and, you know, advertise it. Doesn't mean that we're going to go to 85, 5, mm. you know, doesn't change anything. I think we're all, there's a lot of consensus saying we can pretty much end up here and pretty sure you'd find three votes to end up where you are right now. So it's, Instead of we, are we doing that? We're not doing that until the regular meeting. No, no well, I mean, no, we, we need to know what you need to do because I need to make the changes and then we need to make sure that this number is zero, whatever it is, okay. whatever you do. If I, I'm comfortable with keeping it where it's at. We, you've got to get it green. What's that? you got to get that top number green, adjusted budget balance. So 2100, I, I mean, I could plug in... That's that's it. I could plug in. I don't know. I mean, you I, could plug in five thousand right there, and it turns great. I could plug plug make it one twenty on real estate. Or, yeah, I mean, I could plug in yeah twenty one hundred in one of these numbers, and I'm sure it would probably be. I would prefer not to advertise an increase. Likewise, I think you'll be surprised how many people come running out. Come running out. Yeah, I mean, you raise it to eighty-five five. Yeah. I think they're, I think or eighty-five four. Yeah, they'll be banging down the door. Or just eighty-five would cover. I mean, I'm just saying. I just don't want to see us have a mistake made somewhere because we had that happen last year, and then we got to find a penny or two pennies. That's the only thing I'm saying. They have wiggle room. Not. I mean, we could find it. You can take it from the old hands. It's probably the way to go about it. From what? The old hands. The, the guys that have been around for oh. 10 years. Right? I, I don't know about all that. But <laughs> just, you know, and like I said, this is just advertised. I mean, we've been in here and advertised seven cents higher before. Don Weaver was here 32 years. I think he was said to keep it flat. Yeah. Well, you know, there was uh, I think he would be honest with you. If we'd have been this close and this tight and said, hey, let's just have one penny of leeway that we're not planning on using. But we got it there in case there's a number screw up somewhere. I don't think he'd have had a problem with that. My only concern is <clears throat> you publish that and, you know, we talk hypotheticals of if, if we were okay with this, if we were okay with this, well, then all of a sudden what we're hypothetically okay with raises another cent and a half. And it's like, starts playing in your mind that you've got this. I understand where you're coming from on the leeway. Um, and I know that it's just a published rate, but, you know, I think it's, does display some level of of saying that hey I'm I'm willing to go go here and I'm not 100 percent sure that I'd be willing to go there at the end of the day. Well, I'm not willing to go there, but I also don't want to sit here and tie our hands so that we have to say all right we got to cut this we got to cut this we got to cut this. I think we have flexibility in some items for some cuts and um, it might go beyond our comfort zone, but I think. I think our collections on real estate taxes are going to stay. Uh, I know we said we didn't want to go show too much on that. My only point is if, if, if in the end, if we had to make some adjustments, I think there are some places both on the revenue and 
expense side to make adjustments. So that's why I'd be comfortable with the 84 four. Can we do that? Can you do what? Adjust, adjust our revenues if we set a tax rate to make up the difference? Mr. Wooden? Yeah, you, you, you uh, well, if, I mean, we, if we can do that, I mean, that's fine. Well, I mean, so, but, so, so again, if you're, if you're, if you're advertising a tax rate, just know you cannot go up from that tax rate. Right, so, yeah. But we can do the revenues. We could make the other revenues where we adjusted last week. You could, uh, you could increase the revenues. You just of, have to advertise the budget. Yeah. Right? Then, so then, then, then that's, that. that's the budget amount, but yeah, but you, you cannot go above the 84 for them. Right. Okay. It would be an unfortunate situation. We found ourselves having the conversation saying, why did we set it that, at that rate when we could have set it at this rate? Because something came up that we didn't know was going to happen. So uh, that's, that's my opinion. It comes down to Mr. Hodge, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to my seat. Mr. I'm not Hodge. even sitting in that middle seat. <laughs> I wasn't sitting in it the first two years either. <laughs> you know, a lot of people... <laughs> A lot of citizens don't understand, for example, what an advertised rate. Is. Yeah. So people will see a rate, and to a lot of people, we and they get wound up. Taxes. My dilemma is this: understand the logic of setting it higher and giving yourself room for the unexpected. But in all my years in the corporate boardroom, you also know that there's times you have to do things you don't want to do. As, as unpleasant as they are. Trust me, we were here during some lean years. We had to do things we did not want to do. I understand that. Um, I just remind you about the photo graph you're just doing. <laughs> but, I mean, I, I was going to say I, earlier I actually, I on think your what we graph. Should advertise is the inflation adjusted rate will if, be. <laughs> if, and I, I mean, I appreciate this, but I, I also I, I understand. I another person answer the phone that never do that. <laughs> These statistics would not be right because if we raised our rate up to the 1978 adjusted one, that sucking sound would be people moving to Albemarle and Charlottesville <laughs> for the tax rate. Yeah, but so again, they absorb all their all their property increases. Yeah, I'm I'm sure I could find statistics that would tell you how wonderful we are. <laughs> Um, Mr. Mr. Fairchild would be happy. All the people would leave. So I knew that was going to be your. <laughs> I get the sensation that there's two at eighty four four and two at eighty five five. Can we find go consensus 85. and go eighty five? Could we all agree to that? As long as we can do that, that gives stuff. you some wiggle room, and but, we know we've got the knife that we can use to make cuts. We have that knife at eighty four four too, though. Being we do able to do that other stuff. You were comfortable with eighty four four, right? Yeah, but we don't know if we're going to have a surprise somewhere. Numbers have been known to be wrong. Well, so, I mean, how I've, many times? Love my. <laughs> no. Oh, what is that? Sir, if you contact the county officers, yeah. you'll probably be able to get that answered, sir. Um, um, what was I but, but that, that's that, those items were the, the uh -oh. buffer for if if they're if we stayed at 84 4, those items oh, yeah. were the buffer for if there were unforeseen. Well, that but that that was when I thought we had three hundred and sixty thousand dollars in our pocket. All right, that I made up my mind. I, I mean, the increases are you said you have made up your mind, yes. So, oh, you want to make a motion? Well, so well, we don't I, make it now. Oh, I, 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 I just need to know what the dollar oh. amount, the, the the amount is, because I need to plug. He needs to in. put the. He what? needs to put it on the motion, right? Yeah. Well, there's no motion for this. For, I mean, but it, it, there will be in the will six o'clock. Yeah, you need a number for that motion, correct? Yes. Eighty-four. We'll go with it, and if we have to make cuts, we make cuts. We do the hard choices. We can. That's what we got elected for. Uh, revenue. So 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 let, let, let me just just but clarify. That, let me just clarify. Are we? Know, because again, so the, this budget amount, unless you're changing revenues, you cannot go above the budget amount. Twenty one hundred into or twenty two hundred into the one of those lines. So are y'all okay with that? Yeah. Yeah. Not really. <laughs> I mean, oh man, you're gonna get exactly zero. That's my boy. 
So that, I mean, that's fine. There's there's places we can make cuts. I, I can think of two or three things worth I a mean, penny one of the that we that, added on at the last meeting. One of the things that I, I, I brought up before was the grants right now. There may not be an appetite for that, but if we if we adjust stuff, if we do away with the fire chief position, you know, right. and and I'm not trying to put one office in front of another. I just know what the response will be from other offices if we adjust one office. And I would rather do it all at once, if that makes yeah. sense. My my thought process is if you can get one out of the way, it doesn't all hit you at once. But I see what you're saying. I, I, well, I'm telling you right now, it, it won't all hit you at once, but there'll be a whole lot of, of conversations. Yeah. As soon as you adjust one and not take a look at the others. All right. So, so this budget's good. So then, I mean, uh, if, unless there's, and again, I'm not trying to drag. I mean, we can still make adjustments to it. Yes. Yeah. Up until the day we adopt it. Uh, up until the day, and we just can't go above that right tax rate. Right. Yes. Yep. So, yes. so, so again, we're they're going to plug in all the numbers at eighty four 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 ten for personal property, residential two ninety, personal property, business, public utilities, and dollar ninety machinery tools and everything else that's in in and, their. And I'm going to bet you right now, we got until when do we do this? What day? April twentieth. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no. when we adopt the budget, when we adopt the budget, 20, I'll, I'll guarantee you by 9, April yeah, 15th, 17. there'll be another. I, I have looked at my back of my book. We've been averaging how many houses being built. Uh, if you got another month of houses to go on the books, so you're probably looking at another 20,000, 25,000. Okay. Well, we're at a rate, right? Yes. Yep. All right. That's and Tony, I would tell that person about. The solar that we can walk and chew gum at the same time. Uh, emailed you saying that not to think about it. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I don't hear us talking about the schools. <laughs> so until we prove that, then I don't know. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move the Savannah County Board of Supervisors enter into a closed meeting pursuant to the provisions of Section 2.2-3711A1, Section 2.2-3711A5, Section 2.2-3711A7, Section 2.2-3711A8 of the Code of Virginia 1950 as amended for the purposes of discussing personnel, employees of the Public Works Department, prospective industry, prospective business updates in the Columbia, Cunningham, and Fort Union District, Litigation, Gate Plaza, legal matters, collection of delinquent taxes, Chamber of Commerce. Department. Second. Oops. Sorry. Motion made by Mr. O'Brien, seconded by Mr. Goad. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Chair votes aye, 5 0. We'll see you all the time. No, no, no. Oh, six, six. No, six. It's six. It's six. In three minutes. Right. Yeah. These few times, y'all are killing I am. Yeah. We should be able to plan through some of that early stuff and get to the public hearing. Are you I guess when you're back in the first session, you can remove the one I. Mr. Chair, we're oh, we ready? We're ready. We're ready. Chair, I move to close meeting be adjourned and the Fulana County Board of Supervisors convene again in open session. Be it resolved, the Board of Supervisors does hereby certify to the best of each member's knowledge. One only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements under Section 2.2-3711A of the Code of Virginia 1950 as amended. And two, only such public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened, were heard, discussed, or considered in the meeting. A motion. A second. Second. And this is the one we have to do. Is yes. Roll yeah. call individually. So roll call. Uh, Mr. O'Brien made the motion. Mr. Hodge made uh, second the motion. And then what's your vote? Mr. Hodge votes aye. Mr. Code votes aye. Mr. Sheridan votes aye. <laughs> All right, we have uh, five zero. Check on my name. Check on. Okay. You need a new count. You're good, aren't you? Yeah, you got it right here. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's have a pledge of allegiance. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America 
and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. All right. Um, we'll run from there. <laughs> no changes on adoption of the agenda. Okay. Move to adopt the agenda. Second. Uh, Sheridan made the motion to adopt. Hodge seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Chair votes aye. Five zero. Any administrator? Yep. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, got a few things to report. One, want to announce uh, Michael Carey, a new, uh, actually came back to E911 as a not E911 communication officer. He started on March 18th. Want to welcome uh, Michael Carey back to the county. Um, a little update on road closure here, and this is going to be, you all will probably hear a little bit something about this. So, um, so VDOT will be closing a portion of Route 15 for pipe replacement. So the area of the pipe replacement is located near the Lions Club Baseball Park, Route 15 and 8246 James Madison Highway, which is right around the intersection of Route, 6, Route 672 or Carries Creek Road. Work will begin on, a, on around 7 p.m. March 24th and is anticipated to be completed on or around March 26th. So it's going to be a complete closure of the road. Um, this will be a continuous 24 hour operation until uh, completed signs and message board will be in place for the detour. And so again, the yellow star reflects where the road is closing. And so basically, let's just say you're coming from, I don't know, let's just say you normally are coming from, uh, I don't know, somewhere on route six from Columbia and you're driving up to Zion, you're going to have to take, uh, you have to take six. I'm sorry, six to 15 to six going towards Scottsville and then take Hayden Martin Road all the way around. I mean, obviously, if you're a private individual, if you know a shorter route, you can do that. <laughs> Go through Wilmington. The reason that this route is in place, as VDOT said, is they have to provide for the for the biggest impact, which is tractor trailer trucks. So, I mean, certainly from other from other avenues, if, if, if a local citizen knows of a different way, they can take a different way, but that's the route that they are posting for the detour. And, you know, I had a long conversation with Scott Thornton today about it. Uh, you know, can we just close one lane and, and let traffic go through? You know, basically the reason for it is there was, there was in that culvert there, there was such a large void going through that culvert that they had to they had to do some remediation to fill it in temporarily because it's affecting both sides of the road. They're concerned if they only did one lane, started doing the work, and then allowing vehicles to come through the other lane, that it could potentially cool. right. It could, it could it could be detrimental to their employees mm -hmm. or anyone driving over that. So so they are going to be closing down Route 15 starting this this uh, Sunday at 7 p.m. Yeah. Have we talked to fire and rescue about this? Uh, yes, I know. A I, huge I, impact on yeah, I, I know. Process. I know. I know. Uh, Miss Smith has has talked to some of the folks. I, I think uh, Chief Mayo has actually spoke. He spoke directly to VDOT. I've been in communication with um, the schools because the schools weren't aware today either. I spoke to Mr. Stribling and and, and sent uh, him and Mr. Uh, Dr. Gret some information as well. So, <clears throat> can you email? me and anybody else who wants that slide yeah and i'd like to share it on social media so people know yeah and and, and we're, we're going to put something out too on the county page and, and i think vdot was supposed to be vdot's original map wasn't the best and so they're supposed to be redoing that i'm not sure if it came through yet but if not we will certainly get you this information out. and, and the, you might have said i missed it how long are they estimating this will take? So they're estimating from 7 p.m. Sunday until approximately a.m. Tuesday morning. So the signs kind of make it seem like road work is going to be being done 7 a.m. to 7, 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. during those nights and that, night you, and that you'd be able to traverse the roads during the day. But it's a complete shutdown for 72 hours. It's a complete shutdown. And they couldn't do that over the weekend to avoid 
No, yeah, we, Monday, cause, Monday. Because well, what, what VDOT said, because I asked the same question, I said, couldn't you do it like starting earlier over the weekend? They said that the road is traveled more during the weekend than it is on Monday. Monday is the lightest, Sunday to Monday is the lightest traveled route in that uh, section. The one thing I will say is if they could put it off a week, then the kids are on spring break, it would not affect the schools. That's a good point. Uh, I hadn't thought about it. I thought it was going to be open during the daytime, but I'm like Mr. Goad. I thought it was just yeah. going to be a nighttime. I, and, and if you can talk to them, if that's going to be the case that it is, which obviously it sounds like it is, it'd be nice to maybe have those signs complete. I, am I wrong or did I just read them driving by yesterday? It night seemed day. like it was I just going to be night, night work. I read them. I thought the same thing. You said Kelly said the same thing? All right. I'm feeling pretty smart. Yeah. They, they changed the signs. The same thing. <laughs> they did change. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. Thanks, Chief. So they must have gotten some uh, some feedback. <laughs> a lot of feedback in, but, in numerous yeah, ways. I mean, I mean, we can reach out and uh, Ms. Harris, do you think you could just send Scott Thornton a quick email while we're doing this meeting to see if there. there's any consideration for that? Um, so, yeah, so that's that. Um, and then... Um, uh, on, a, on a lighter note, um, Fluvanna County Parks and Rec presents the 2024 annual Easter egg hunt at Pleasant Grove. Again, free ages 12 and younger, 10 a.m. Saturday, March 30th. Please arrive early. The hunt begins promptly at 10 and hunts. The hunt ends when the last egg is found. Bring your own basket. And as anyone has ever been there, it's a it's a mad dash to get Easter <laughs> eggs. So good, good time had by all. And then just some up, up and coming um, meetings. So next week, March 27th at 5.30, we have a scheduled budget work session. It's to be determined in the Morris room. Do we want to continue and have that budget work session at that time? Thoughts? Are we going to have anything compelling between that and the next one? Or I guess we would do one or the other. Is that what you're thinking? Well, I mean, well, I, we could do. You do you think we can hammer it out on April the 3rd? Or do we need the uh, 27th? I think we could probably finish it on April. 3rd. I agree. We just stay there until we have to. Okay. I hate to say it that way. And that way we don't have one on March 27th. Yep. I agree. Worked for me. Okay. All right. Damn, we'll, that was easy. Well, we'll make that change. <laughs> that, that's all I have to report. Yeah, fine. Right here, baby. <laughs> all right. Um, we're going to move on to uh, public comment number one. Um, Anyone wishing to address the board should come to the podium, state your name and address. Please remember to keep your comments to five minutes on topic direct into the board. Anybody wishing to make comment? I'm speaking to impose the language in resolution 1524 that would remove utility scale solar generation from A1 as a use allowed by special permits. Uh, I reviewed the meeting last week, last, uh, the last meeting, uh, March 6th, and I didn't see any enthusiastic support for that language in there. In fact, I saw a considerable uh, reasons why we shouldn't have it. And uh, there's an old story about the, a family that went to Abilene. Uh, and the father says, well, let's go to Abilene. Everybody says, okay, let's go. And they get in the car and they drive two hours to Abilene. And you get there and you go, you find them come here. And nobody knew. Okay. And I don't want us to get to Abilene. Um, the uh, if we, send, if we wish to send a message to Richmond about an ill-considered bill that is up for review, there are better ways to do this. Uh, we can have a referendum, do a petition drive, we can do any sorts of things. But I don't think we need to put this sort of language out there. Uh, uh, you know, uh, there's many reasons not to include the language. And uh, I think what Mr. O'Brien says several of these, and I just want to reiterate. <coughs> Firstly, it's excessively restricting. There's no need to ban all utility scale solar from A1. There's no reason to do it. The board has the power to say when and where that development comes. 
It ignores the property rights of individuals. Okay, we have farmers who are aging out. Okay, uh, people my age. I'm I'm at the tail end of baby boomers. I wouldn't want to be out there working a farm at my age. You know, and I might want to leave something for my family. I don't want to leave a solar farm that's going to generate uh, a good income uh, for the family that doesn't really want to farm my land. Um, plus, it's going to lose millions of dollars in revenue from taxes and fees. Okay, uh, we're going to lose that revenue if we just totally ban it. Uh, someday we might wish that we had distributed generation. You know, we've got a couple of really good power generators in the county. And if one or two of them had to shut down for some reason, you might want to run your air conditioner. Uh, 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 of course, it sends the wrong signal to potential solar developers that we don't want it here at all. Okay, And that's a bad move for economic development because... When a, when a developer comes to open a business in Louisiana County, he's going to want to know that we have plenty of power to run his business. Um, so it's also time, like I said, to do something positive for the farmers. Because where these utility scales are going to be located are within a couple miles of a transmission line on a 40 to 50 acre plot. That's that's about minimum for a utility scale. And that's going to be generating about $21,000 income per acre every year. Now, this is, this is something nice to meet your family. And it's not something that a farmer can do on his own. He's going to have to have somebody put up that half a million dollars per acre to put that solar farm in. Uh, so... Uh, what we do need is to adopt common sense regulations that would protect our scenic nature, uh, water quality, and protect landowners from exploitation. Because I've talked to some people, uh, they would love to have a solar generating uh, farm on their property, but they want to know that that farm is going to be taken care of for 30 years, 20, 30 years, and that there's going to be some way to put the land back when it, when it's all done. And that's where the regulations come in. I see a good purpose for all that. But uh, uh, I would urge you to table this resolution until the prohibition of utility scale Solar in A1 is removed from it. Please write the language about a cold day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else want to comment? Good evening. Uh, my name is James Kelly, 363. Um, obviously, it's a, uh, it's a long season. Some, some years it feels like I spend more time here than I do at home. Uh, I just wanted to uh, congratulate you all on a milestone that we're going to set in a couple of minutes in terms of setting the tax rate. I obviously was a bit late today, but it, it's clear that you all had um, a direction and we are moving along through this process. I want to thank you um, for the time that we spent together a couple of weeks ago where we really went through our budget proposal for the thoughtful questions that we all asked for the action items and follow ups, both short term and long term. Um, I will continue to convey that I believe that the, the school budget um, is a real communication of need from the school division. I don't think it includes all of our needs, for example, our salary study, which we have spoken about and not only over the last year here, is not included because our board did not want to take in a recurring cost into, uh, excuse me, a one-time cost into a recurring study. And so I hope that we can find a way to partner to, to make that happen. Um, and I hope that if any of you are interested, um, as you look at CIP as well, uh, if you if any of you are interested in setting eyes on any of the infrastructure buildings, literally any time I will clear my calendar and, and meet you at a school and 
be happy to walk through. I'm confident that if I need to shake your Dr. Gretz or Dr. Stribling, we will absolutely all be there if we can. Uh, I know that um, Mr. O'Brien and I got an email as it relates to the infrastructure in our schools, and I think that the best way that we can dispel misinformation if it exists or to set eyes on all problems is to physically be there and to, to, to be shown what it is that we're investing in and um, to get to see it in context and in use for, for you know, where are our tax dollars going. Uh, but TLDR here is uh, thank you so much for the time. And I know that we got a couple of weeks ahead of us still as it relates to closing up the budget over here. But, um, I really appreciate the time you spent with us, the amount of rigor that you placed on making these decisions. And uh, as always, everyone of you has an SL number. I am always available if you have questions that we're this week. Great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm not happy not to know what TLDR means. <laughs> I just went right over What does TLDR mean? Uh, I'm yeah, definitely not. Too long, didn't read. <laughs> <laughs> Susan Morris, 6840 Thomas Jefferson Parkway, Delmar, Virginia, 2963. I would like to thank you all for being proactive and realizing that we do not know enough at this point about solar. We do know and did find out with the extreme cold in some areas of this country that the electric vehicles didn't work too well, nor did the chargers. We also know and have found out that um, the lithium batteries can be very dangerous. Um, I think that uh, Mr. Lago Marcino realized that. So I would like to thank you for thinking ahead and realizing that we don't want to always be the first to do something when we might say we wish we hadn't before. I'm one of those groups of aging farmers, and my husband is. And we were approached long before, several years before, solar started coming here. We were approached right after, I guess, the Palmer solar had been put in. I did quite a bit of research and it all sounds wonderful, the money, etc. But I said, no, you don't know what is going to be left of your land. You don't know what the runoff is going to be. And why do we acquiesce to our enemies who pollute much more than the United States. Why do we shut down our industries? What's left after 40 years of this? Blue Baron has just come up with a tourism plan and they've gotten a book on this, they've gotten online, and why do we want acres and acres of solar panels anywhere in this county. Why do we want to have, um, to not know what's going to be left of our land? Why do we want to jeopardize the tourism, which we have just gotten a hold of and try to work with that? Why do we want it? There's, there are not enough transmission lines also. And so the amount of land which might be necessary in some areas to meet up with the transmission line may need acres more that are used so that these new transmission lines can be built. Uh, so I thank you for looking ahead for Blue Valley County and we are some aging farmers that were on the front lines, one of the first to be approached. And we weighed the things and we decided no. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? All right. Um, seeing no one, we'll close the first round of public comment. 
and we have no appointments, do we? Nope, nope. Okay. Uh, no presentation, presentations. <clears throat> we'll move on to action matters. Mr. Chairman, we need to go to the public hearings next because it's seven o'clock. Public hearings are advertised at seven o'clock. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, yeah, so we're going to move to public hearings first. Um, and item E, public hearing to amend sections 22 22 22 22-6.2.1, 22-5-2.1, 22-6.2.1, 22-7-9.1, 22-8.2.1, and 22-22-1, and to enact 22-17-20, the county code to authorize the short-term rental of residential dwellings by right in the A1, R1, R2, R3, and R4 zoning districts <coughs> subject to supplemental regulations. Mr. Whitten? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, <coughs> uh, members of the board. So this ordinance came before the Planning Commission and the Planning Commission forwarded it on to this board, five to zero. Um, there has been a few changes since that point that I'll go over. Uh, but basically, right now in our ordinance, we don't have short-term rentals as a use. There are short-term rentals throughout the county. If you look on Airbnb, BRBO, you'll see them throughout Fluvanna County. Um, so basically, short-term rental is a provision of room or space. It can be a room in a house or the whole house for a period of less than 30 days in exchange for our charge. So next slide. And so the big change, Senate Bill 544 has been approved by the House and the Senate, hadn't been signed by the governor. He has until April 8th to consider signing it. I checked this morning, he hadn't signed it yet. So basically what it says is that localities can't require a special use permit for the use of a residential dwelling as a short-term rental, where the dwelling unit is also legally occupied by the property owners as primary residence. And this is only for ordinances that go into effect after December 31st, 2023. So originally when this went to the Planning Commission, the Planning Commission recommended not allowing short-term rentals of townhouses and duplexes. But now if this ordinance is signed by the governor and, the, and a property owner lives there as their primary dwelling, they would be able, so Sycamore Square, the townhouses to Colonial Circle, for instance, they would be able to rent them by right if, they're, if it's their primary residence. So that's the big change you'll see in the ordinance. So we can regulate short-term rentals through our land use authority and the state code. It does make short-term rentals a by right use. So when we went to the planning commission, it was a short-term rental of a detached single family dwelling. Now it's just a residential dwelling, which is the language from the state code. So the definition of residential dwelling, uh, basically short-term rental of a residential dwelling is a residential dwelling that's rented for compensation for a period of less than 30 days. And then you see the 22-17-20 for supplemental regulations. So the Planning Commission did suggest additional language at their public hearing, where if there are multiple single family um, detached dwellings on a farm, for instance, there could be one short-term rental for every 10 acres of land. So their worry is if you had a 300 acre farm with four um, houses on it, they wanted the people there to be able to rent each of those houses. So that's the Planning Commission came up with language one for every 10 acres of land. But I did, because of the Senate Bill 544, I added language that that applies to agricultural land because technically a duplex is one parcel, but you could have two short-term rentals within that one parcel. So that if you look, when we get to the ordinance, you'll see where I added agricultural <coughs> land, that supplemental regulation just applies to that. So the, talked about the next two things, you get the next slide. So I'll go over the supplemental regulations. There's quite a few of them. Um, but because it's by right and not by a special use permit, we want everything to be in the ordinance because there's not going to be any conditions that we can implement. So the owners do have to pay the application fee and submit the application to the community development department. And then the owners provide the contact information for the owner or manager. And talked about the for detached single family dwellings, one rental per 10 acres of land for agricultural land. And then one item where I have it drafted this way, but we, it's up for discussion, is for townhouses, single family attached and two family dwellings, I stated it has to be legally occupied by the property owner as his primary residence. So when the planning commission and board prior discussed this, basically they wanted to allow someone to buy a house in the county and rent it out as a short-term rental. They want to allow that use. 
but it seemed to be the consensus was they didn't want someone to be coming and buy a townhouse or a duplex and rent it out. So that's why I have this language that has to be their primary residence, but the board feels differently after the public hearing. That's something we can discuss because if we change that regulation, it'd be less restrictive if we didn't have that language in there, if you understand. So just to saying. clarify the way you have it written now, it would have to be, if it were a townhome or multifamily, it would have to be that, the person who's renting it's family primary residence? It would have, the person who lives there, who owns it, it'd have to be their primary residence. Okay. Is so in that case, they might be just be renting out like a room in the, in there or something, correct? Or so if they, if they rented out the, let's say Sycamore square, gotcha. if they rented that unit or they owned it and rented it out to someone else, they wouldn't be able to use it as a short-term rental okay. because they don't, it's not their primary residence and they, but, but, but say it's their primary residence, say they want to go somewhere for two weeks, but they want to rent out their primary residence for two weeks while they're gone. They could do they that. They could do that as long okay. as they own it and it's their primary residence. I was just wondering why if it was their primary residence, they'd be using it as an air, but that makes sense. I see what you're saying. Yeah. People, you know, might, maybe they live in Florida six months out of yeah. the year and they want to rent out their townhouse at Sycamore square for six months okay. out of the year. Right. So we can talk about that after um, we get through all the regulations to see if we want to change that. But um, also I have language, the short-term rental may not take place in an accessory apartment or accessory structure. We found on Airbnb, there's tree houses in the County that are rented as Airbnbs. Um, and they're very fancy tree houses, they have hot tubs and electric and plumbing, but <laughs> they're a tree house. Um, they rent for $200 a night. So right we, there should be no visible evidence of the short-term rental other than one sign for squeak, four square feet maximum. Uh, they have to comply with the Flavana noise ordinance, outdoor burning, not within a designated fire pit. And use of fireworks is not allowed. So you would still have a, be able to allow to have a fire pit. You have to comply with all health department regulations and the maximum number of occupants would be determined according to the health department. So if you have a three bedroom septic, you would only be allowed you know, six people. Uh, the parking <coughs> the dwelling has to be in the driveways or approved parking areas. It can't be offsite yards. The property boundaries have to be marked as if there's a, a lake on a neighboring property, people aren't going there and, going for a swim when it's not part of the property. But that can be, it can be just a, a document in the house, correct? Yeah. You said it could be a map. I mean, yeah. you could have, you know, signs on the trees or you could just have a map showing where the property boundaries are. It just has to be marked, you know, marked where the boundaries are. Compliant, they have to comply with all state building code, fire and health and safety regulations. There has to be a fire extinguisher and smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detector. Something with what's, what's going on. Okay, hold on. <clears throat> when you said I'm not sharing. Oops. Let me fight you. Let me see. Excuse us during a technical difficulties. Do, do, do. So while they resolve this, I have another question. So you mentioned that there will be registration of these with the community development department. Correct. Will there... Um, how or no, is there going to be some kind of uh, inspection before or periodic inspections for carbon monoxide smoke detectors, fire extinguishers, and no. who would perform that? So carbon monoxide detectors are required, but we don't have an inspection program as part of it. Okay. That's not in the regulations. We can discuss that. So it is required that there be a, are we good? Yeah, we're good. There it is required they have a carbon monoxide detector on each floor and in any attached garage. And our building official did review this language, but there is not an inspection program. Some counties do that where the building official has to go out and inspect these short-term rentals before they can be used. But that there's not, we don't have that language currently okay. in the ordinance. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. 
-hmm. And also the owner does have to register the rental with the commissioner of revenue because now they will be collecting transient occupancy taxes. And the regulations are not intended to limit the restrictions of an owner's association. So you would still not, still couldn't have a short-term rental like Monticello because the HOA covenants prohibit it. And owners unable to meet the above requirements would be prohibited from um, operating the rental. So we do have some options. We could do civil penalties, criminal penalties, or an injunction if those don't penalties don't work. And so real quickly, I want to talk about grandfathering. So basically, the ones that are currently in use are not grandfathered because they were never allowed under the county code. So they're basically non-conforming illegal uses. And so um, we're not at, because this is a by right use, we're not adding language that says for the existing uh, rentals. Now there are a couple tree houses in the county that are under this ordinance would not be allowed. So we're not grandfathering those tree houses that are currently being rented on Airbnb because we're saying no accessory dwellings could be rented at short term dwellings. Like you couldn't rent your garage, like a, a, a above, yeah. above garage room or something. But like yeah, that. if you have a room above your garage, correct, or your basement. And next one. So agritourism, we talked about this last meeting or when we last discussed this, but I just want to bring it up again. So for instance, like Hardwood Hills Winery, Pretty Hill Orchard, basically under this attorney general opinion, because they allow members of the public to come there and it's agritourism, all the short-term rentals there would be allowed by right. So there could be an argument that this attorney general opinion is just persuasive, you know, not mandatory authority, but there's an argument if they had you know, a tree house or, you know, a garage apartment that could fall under um, agritourism and be allowed by right. If you have that agritourism component on your property existing, Correct. like you're doing some something. You have to sense. grow stuff on yeah. the property and allow and allow activities for where the general public can come and visit. Then there could be that agritourism exemption. Is so that just gives in the language um, from the attorney general where he talked about how it would fall under agritourism. And so were there any questions or we can look at the um, ordinance also if you want to see any language in the ordinance where it changed from what the planning commission. Can you pull that up? Mm -hmm. to see the, <coughs> what change? Um, well, staff discussed that basically we didn't think the changes were so major that they needed to go back to the planning commission because it was just reflecting um, what the state code that hadn't been signed at this point, but with the state, most likely it's still be signed by the governor because it was pretty overwhelmingly passed in the yeah. Senate and the House. Um, but you kind of look, I changed from uh, detached single family dwelling to residential dwelling because uh, under the state code, that's the new language. And then um, I took out annual um, application because now since it's a buy right use, I thought it made more sense to just have a one-time application at the beginning and there can be a right now we haven't even designated what the fee would be it'd be a nominal fee um, just for administrative time and then you can see the language in b where basically any parcel of multiple single family dwellings could have one short-term rental per 10 acres so if you have 200 acres with four parcel with four short-term rentals you would allow that so the one um, is c where basically for townhouses duplexes triplexes you have to legally occupy the residence. You have to, and also own it in order for it to be used as a short-term rental. So if that's something we want to discuss and make that less restrictive, that's something we could bring up. My, my only question is that would the governor's signage of that bill make that less restrictive eventually, or no. we could keep this even with the bill being passed? Because his language said they had to legally occupy it and they had to own it. Okay. So, so now say I'm a property owner and I own both units in the duplex. Could I live in one and rent the other one out? Yeah, I talked to the plan department and we we both agreed that they would be allowed to do that. Because that's pretty common. You live on one side and rent the other side. Yeah, out. like your neighbor passes mm -hmm. away or sells it, you just buy up the one next to <laughs> But if you rent it out both sides, you wouldn't be allowed right. to rent it as a short term rental. Because there'd be two in the 10 acres. And then the definition I just changed it to residential dwelling instead of detached single family dwelling. There's if you go down, it shows the language in subsection D, and it's only for ordinances enacted after December 31st. So other counties that already have ordinances in effect, like Albemarle County requires special use permits. 
it doesn't affect their ordinances. So it only you can have a special use permit on top of this to allow an exemption as well, too. For sorry, like let's that. say you know somebody wants to petition the board for a special use permit to have more than one house per 10 acres. Oh, sure, you could have a process. So we had a text, you know, that. text amendment to allow that. Yeah, we could, um, yeah, we could allow that, correct. I have, I'm almost afraid to ask this question. I have questions, but I wonder if I, we should reserve our questions until after we can. We can have the public hearing first and then have questions, or I can answer questions now either way. Um, well, my own question is this you talked about the tree houses. Correct. So we're saying those are not allowed? Correct. Right now, we say the supplemental regulation says no accessory apartments and no accessory dwellings. So you can't rent out your guest house. Let's say you have a pool house, you can't rent that out. If you build a tree house, you can't rent that out under the way it's currently, the way it went to the planning commission. Now the board could, if the board wanted to do that, they could. The they could take could. that out and it, yeah. since it's because less restrictive. Less restrictive. Yeah. The only reason I bring that up is when this first started, it was because of a tree house. Mm -hmm. Not only was it because of a tree house, well, that, that individual went through the planning department, um, you know, thought they were doing all the right things spent about forty thousand dollars or more creating and building this tree house and it is quite the tree house <laughs> uh then we're told that no they couldn't do this because you know we didn't have an ordinance allowing for short-term rentals and then they pointed out the fact that there were some county staff members who in fact also had a tree house so the board decided to vote to not enforce until an ordinance was put in place um, I suspect there's probably a few people that have garages that they fixed up and may put the top on, you know, as well too, they can rent out or that have, you know, something creative. I know, I think it's in Goochland, not necessarily here, but somebody had a railroad car that had been converted into an Airbnb. <clears throat> um, so that's one of the things that I would have an objection to is this, you know, a restriction that is being put in place with these particular items. But as I said, I'll reserve my questions and comments till later. So you want to have public hearing first and then Yeah, well, I just think it's useful to hear from people and see what yeah. they have to say. I want to open up the public hearing. Everybody good? All right. We'll open up the public hearing. Please keep your comments to five minutes on topic and direct it to the board. Anybody wish to speak? Yeah. I live at 4874 Thomas Jefferson Parkway, and uh, my husband and I are farmers. We are in the process of renovating a max single family home with the intention of being able to rent it out on our video for Airbnb. Is this better? There, yeah. there we go. I can hear you now. <laughs> okay. So I'll, should I start again? Um, I good. think we got it. All right. All right. Yeah. So I, first of all, want to thank the board and the planning commission for taking the time to research this and do the initial legwork, because I think it's something that the county desperately needs, especially with our emphasis on bringing more tourism into the county in order to preserve our rural nature. But when people come here, they need some place to stay. And I think that this is a great revenue base for the county also. Um, we have no problem with paying um, taxes on the additional income. So, but I would like the county to consider changes to two items in the proposed code. Number one, um, we're talking about use permitted by agriculture A1. So not all farms are over 10 acres, but if your property is zoned A1, you by right in the definition of the code can build two detached single family homes on the property without having to subdivide it. So we are asking that either a clause be placed in there exempting farms from the 10 acre requirement because my property is 15.67 acres that we are working on renovating. And 
we are working on the main house right now, but the intention later on was to build a caretaker's cottage, which could also be rented out. Um, but by limiting it to one home per 10 acres means that the farm would then have to be 20 acres in order to be able to rent out a second home. And so we're asking that that be considered because it does limit our ability to promote agritourism and have people stay in a farm environment while visiting Fluviana County. So the second thing that we're requesting a consideration for rephrasing is where it says, that the owner shall also agree to restrict occupancy in the short-term rental to, to, no, to no more than two persons per lawful bedroom. I do agree that anything done with the short-term rental should meet the health code you know, and the building code. However, I would like it to say two adults rather than two occupants because if a family is traveling with their children you know, say they have minor children that are traveling with them, they may want to rent someplace that is a one bedroom and have everybody stay in the same place. Or maybe you want to get together with and have a family reunion and you're going to have brothers and sisters traveling from across the country with their children and have those children stay in the bedroom with them. So um, I think that by saying no more than two persons per lawful bedroom, we're limiting people being able to travel with small children. And I think it should be read adult. And those are the only two considerations that we're asking the board to look at. In other words, I'm really excited about this program, code, measure, whatever it's called. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wishing to speak? All right, seeing none, I guess we'll turn it back to the board for questions and comments. What was the, do you know the number of the, of the clause that she referenced with regard to the bedroom? Yes, that's uh, number, subsection I. Basically at the end of it says- oh, You gotta close the public hearing. Oh, I thought oh, you did yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah. <coughs> no one wishing to speak, we'll close the public hearing. So if you look at subsection I, it says the owner shall also agree to restrict occupancy in the short-term rental to no more than two persons per lawful bedroom. So what she's requesting is a state to no more than two adults per lawful bedroom. So it's less restrictive, so you could make that change if you so desire. Um, and then as far as the 10 acres, the Planning Commission did throw out different, I know Ms. Morgan threw out five acres. So if you wanted to change it to um, one short-term rental per five acres of land, that's less restrictive. So you could do that. Could we well. do a, a, I'm guessing I know what the planning commission was referring to. If you took 200 acre farm and had 20 rentals on it or that's, 18, 19 rentals. I can't remember can whether that was. the yeah. number of rentals? I think, I think some of the concern was if, depending on where you were, if there were so many so many houses near other residents too, I think was a little. There, there was one parcel over off 250 that had eight rentals within less than 20 acres. Right. And now, yeah. and right now they're rented long-term, but the concern was that they would start renting them short-term if we didn't have that restriction. So that was the example that was brought up, uh, but they still wanted to allow, you know, farms and agricultural uses to, you know, be able to rent the different um, tenant houses and main houses that were on the farm. I think our thought was just not to have little Airbnb neighborhoods popping up. No, that's, that's what, what I, I thought, thought I'm was, talking yeah. about, like a cluster subdivision of, of, of Airbnb. Airbnb. Yeah. <clears throat> Would it restrict it by special use then? Well, you could allow that. Right now, there's not a special use permit process. So, so you could have that say, as an option. Yeah, exceptions or greater density by special use only. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. Uh, I mean, and then that gives them the flexibility. I find. Um, <clears throat> A lot of this ordinance to be overly restrictive, uh, and and I think a lot of this ultimately gets dictated by the market. Uh, you know, as as much as we want to see tourism grow in Fluvanna, I don't really see that you're going to see a lot of people coming in if we had 500 rentals here taking up the entire place. So it's it's a little bit of a market driven thing uh, from that standpoint. Um, you know, I think the restriction on the acreage uh, per homes is too limiting. I think that the restriction on the other types of accessory dwelling units is too limiting. 
Um, I think that, you know, part of somebody who's trying to create an Airbnb business is that they're looking to be creative in different ways that they might go about it. So it doesn't address, for example, clamping, you know, as a basic example, just literally pitching for 10 if you wanted to do that. Um, I think that you have the ability to come back to these ordinances and address them if the problem becomes, you know, of some nature. I mean, for example, you know, down at Lake Anna, they've had some real issues, but basically what the governor's put in place is, is you know, basically saying, yes, you can go ahead and do what you want to do there. But the problem they had down at Lake Anna was, you know, 20, 30 people showing up to a house and partying and disturbing the neighborhood from that standpoint. And I think there's a reasonable limitation, but, you know, I stayed in Airbnb just the other uh, week. We stayed in Airbnb uh, and it did not have that heart shaped bed, but, <laughs> but it did have a bedroom that had two queen beds in it. And you could certainly see four people staying in those two queen beds if you looked at it from that perspective. Are we really going to get in the business of regulating how many people are showing up into, you know, a bedroom? Again, I think that that's somewhat limited and driven by the landlord, his vision, and how he's trying to put that in. So I would be very much in favor of scrapping many of these more restrictive measures um, and, and, you know, reserving those for the ability to come back to them uh, is my opinion on this. So like the, you mentioned that what was happening at Lake Anna, but if you don't have that, like that restriction on how many people per bedroom or something, how are you going to keep that from happening? Yeah, I, I'm not, I, again, I think, you know, the, the, the landlord can kind of drive that themselves. I mean, first of all, you know, the, 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 there is a, a, a recreational aspect about Lake Anna, everybody at the lake coming down, partying hard there. I don't necessarily see the same kind of thing happening, you know, at that level, but you know, what, what maybe we put a, a number per a, uh, square footage as a possibility, but I just don't see the restricting bedrooms as a, as a either enforceable mechanism or really a, a smart way to go about it. You know? Ever been to a class of 1980s reunion for Fort Union down in Primo? <laughs> you get about 45 people in a house. <laughs> And, and it's the no, exception. See, and yeah. That might be the yeah. exception. I used to go to Nags Head, and there'd be twenty people, yeah. and ten of us were sleeping out on the deck or something. Sure. Like that, I went with, with spring break, and I didn't even stay in my room. There were seventeen people in the bed. But if we had, if we had that much agritourism happening in Florida County, we'd probably be looking at other things from that standpoint. So Fair point. The only offsetting consideration you might want to think about with that is is just septic systems. I'm I'm sure from VDH's standpoint, the septic system is put in for a certain size family and flow and I, I think if you're allowing you could potentially run into the issue of if you got you know six people per room and it's being rented out every night that may not be what the system was intended for granted and then, and, and then the landlord would face the repair of their septic system and then right. make a decision so that's right. why I say there's certain things that you know are sort of market driven by this you know if, if you overload it with people and you know, you still only collected the three hundred dollars, and now you have a thirty thousand dollars septic repair bill. You, you oh, good probably you got two queen beds in a room. Mm -hmm. If you have a room big enough for two queen beds, and you say you can only have two people, you could obviously have four. Well, and and I, I suspect that if if, if per, people really knew what was going on, for example, I'm surprised the treehouse people aren't here because they were pretty vocal about it. But I guess that there's probably a lot of people that have barns that have been renovated like and other houses. things like that. Something we could put in there. I don't know how we could do that. I mean, you could add accessory you, dwellings. You can remove that restriction. Because right now it the says the use shall not take place within an accessory apartment or accessory dwelling. If you just struck through that, it's less restrictive. So you could just totally, if there's a majority in favor of that, well, you could just remove that well, restriction. Can, somebody give me the opposite side of that. Of what? Accessory if we, dwelling. If we take that out, what's, mean, what's, what's the bad yeah. What's the bad side of that? Why, you know, my question would be, why was it, why was that restriction there in the first place? And is that worth it? I guess asking the same thing I, at a different I, level. I, I honest to goodness went home yesterday and looked up tree houses. Shenandoah. And the first, the third one that popped up was Palmyra. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's nice. What are they, what were they trying to prevent yeah, by having that? I think it's, it, you know, excess number of people, you know, cars, so many people add that residence because you might be renting, you know, the main house plus the accessory dwelling in the back. 
Um, I think that was kind of the concern. I know in Almaro County, they, if you use the accessory dwelling, they require a special use permit. So for instance, like my cousin has a house and then they convert their barn to an apartment. So they would requ be required to have an SUP because it's an accessory dwelling. So you could also have an access, I mean, an SUP process as well for accessory dwellings, or you could just allow them by right. And, 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 I, and I think that that's a way to approach it. But again, I would argue that you can get back to that point if you need to. Right? Yeah, you know, I'm not saying, I'm In other words, you, for example, with this tree house, I don't think we've had anybody complain or any letters saying from those neighbors, yeah. hey, you know, there's too much activity going on in this tree house. So <laughs> while I can understand those concerns, you know, by the same token, I sit there and I think, you know, our objective is to bring people to Fluvanna, to show them the beauty of Fluvanna, to, to make it easy. Um, and, and, you know, an Airbnb uh, property owner um, participates in that process um, to make it attractive to come. But prices are going to be driven by the number of properties. Prices are going to be driven by the quality of properties. You know, prices and experiences and reviews are going to be driven by what people experience. That's kind of the beauty of the system is that it does sort of self-regulate itself. And I don't know that we have to spend a lot of time regulating it. And I certainly wouldn't want to go through a bunch of SUP hearings for an accessory dwelling unit when it's not a problem today. You know, it's kind of my opinion. I'd rather strike it. And then, you know, 10 years from now, if we've got to review it, well, we can review it at that point in time. Regarding the accessories, you said anything I don't disagree with. I, I, my question, my only point for asking why it was there was, I'm assuming it's there for a worst case scenario and I couldn't envision what that worst case scenario would be. So that's why I asked my question. Yeah, Go ahead. I mean, I, I, I have no reason to, I don't have no reason to disagree with what Mr. O'Brien said there. So I mean, can we go ahead and strike? So I, I think can I part agree? of your motion, they will strike subsection D from a supplemental regulations right. when you get to the motion. Okay. But if there's any other regulations you want to discuss. So, 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 so yeah, so it's not like, it's not like everyone was majority at least said D. I mean, so I think the other one was the, the uh, 10 acres of land, 10 acres, 10, which was B. I screen. would suggest one per three acres. That would be my suggestion. I like the five that Mr. Goat said. Five was, we moved up from five to 10 on the planning commission. Again, I think as Mr. Sheridan said, uh, as Mr. Sheridan noted, that our thought process, and we spent a lot of time talking about that, if I recall, Dan. We did. Um, and I don't remember if that was before, after I was on this board, but regardless, I mean, there was a long discussion there about, and there were some people who thought 10 was a little too much. I, I could definitely get on board with, with five. Um, you know, I, I think it, definitely addresses some concerns that we may have had uh and and maybe we went a little bit too restrictive on 10 i think coming back to five would well could you put a thing in there to do if somebody somebody had nine acres and wanted to put two or put one what i'm saying is could they come back with oh. sup well right now we don't have the sup process i mean we, we have, have to, to introduce so, that yeah, as yeah, a text yeah. amendment yeah. why don't so you mentioned not having a bunch. Do you think we'd have a bunch of SUPs there? I'm kind of okay with if they come before us with an SUP and we're like, okay, this makes a lot of sense. Let's go ahead and, and then allow this. I, I think I'd be okay with that. So, so do we have, do, do we, do we have more that have, are there interests in five? Yeah. So, do, do I understand right that it'd have to be for, for each of those would have to be at least five. So in other words, you can't have seven acres and you'd you have to have it? 10 acres for two yeah, yeah. short term rentals. Yeah. yeah but do you yeah. count your house as part of the 10? Yes. So yes. you'd only have one right. with 10 acres. Well, so that's if you're renting your house. Oh, sure. Yeah. If you're renting, if you're not renting your house, if you're just renting your pool, pool house out, you'll be allowed to do that. Yeah, I got a pool house. It's yeah. right down next to the well, that, creek. But that's a, <laughs> so that's an accessory dwelling unit. And so yeah, if, we, remo if we remove that right. restriction, then you would be allowed to rent your pool house. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Which means that's that you can add that more than Atlantic to. Much. I mean, so if you rent your main house and your pool house and you only had like five, five acres, you wouldn't be allowed place. to do this. Under what if you have your main house, another house, and your pool house, and you're on eight acres? You wouldn't be allowed to do it. You're not allowed to do nope. it. Right. You'd have to have 15 acres. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. That, 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 that's what I'm saying. You'd have to have 15 in order to have three dwellings yes. on there. Yours and, and then the other two. Yes. And I mean, we could create a special use pro process that would have to go back to the planning commission. That, that's something um, but that's an option. Mm -hmm. I, I, again, I, I lean on the yes. side of, you know, is this going to become a problem and what's the market for it? And, you know, or why are we, why are we favoring somebody who has 10 acres versus somebody who has nine acres or eight acres? 
you know, I think we're being a little too restrictive on this. And I, and I get that, you know, part of the planning process is to look to the future, but, you know, ordinances can and do change but with regularity. So there is nothing that is, you know. So if we made it five tonight and we found that that was the issue, we could come back and change it to three. Yes. You, well, you could change it to three or you could start with three and make it five or you could start with four. I'm just saying, you know, you got you got wiggle room. My, my suggestion, I mentioned it to Mr. Goad, was the reason I lent towards five was the Planning Commission had discussed that and I want to take into consideration their deliberations. I'm good with five. I'd be concerned about going under. Again, could be likely nothing's going to happen, but um, if it becomes an issue, please come see us. Yeah. And and I'm also in favor of having some special use. So where somebody in extraordinary circumstances with a very compelling case can come before us and then we allow that. I think that's a yeah. It leaves you room we to don't make have to add that right now. That'd have to be as no. EPA, right? Well, yeah, yes. that's to go back to the planning yeah. commission. And so. and, and, and no. our special use permits just a request. There's no extraordinary circumstances. Just, yeah. I want to do this, you know. Yeah. yeah. You come in and look at it. So yeah. So it sounds like five's the five's the number for, for B. So yeah. paragraph B we wanted to change with five. Yep. And then so, and strike D and wasn't I and to I, change it to adults. Yes, the last sentence was to change it to two adults for a local bedroom. Well, I go back to that. If you have two couples that travel together and there's two beds in there, all of a sudden they can't you can't have four. You mean a one bedroom, a one bedroom two with two beds. Two with two beds. Yeah. Yeah. What's the enforcement on that? I mean, basically you would get a complaint from the neighbor that hey, there's this house of five cars, it's a two bedroom house. So that's my only purpose of of, and I hear what you're saying, Mr. O'Brien. I do. My only thing is if we're not really, if we don't have an enforcement officer out there going enforcing this, okay, maybe everybody that stays in one, but when it does become a problem, at least we have that teeth in the ordinance to say, you have too many people in here, you need to do something about it. If you're on 10 acres already, you know, basically, is where we're one, five. now five. One, now five. Well, we're also talking about in R1 and R2 and R3. And it could be a third and town acre homes and R3. And, and, and everything as well. I mean, we're not just talking about, about, Mr. and Mrs. Haynes' land where they have a ton of it. And when we're talking about Sycamore Square. R3 could be in the lake. Well, it's no, prohibited by the HOA. You're not and I think if you're on water and sewer, it's not big a concern. It's if you're on well and yeah. septic, that's the concern. I, I think the so. use, the reason they put the a number of adults, and we discussed something about this, about college kids coming in and throwing a huge party. It was a market point. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Again, yeah. well, well, why are they going to come to Flavana and throw a huge party when they can go to Lake Ann? Because they got a farm. Party, you know? Know? <laughs> I'm not even going to throw anybody under the bus because they got a pond and a farm. They can go sit out there and they ain't bothered nobody. They, they might. Yeah, they might do that. So My only concern with, with not enumerating it in some measure is that if you do want to enforce, in the event that you ever do want to enforce something, you have no teeth there. So I will, I will just counter with this. Okay. We haven't had any enforcement. We haven't had any complaints in almost four or five years. And that's when we brought the subject up. Who know who knows how long this has really been going on in Fluvanna County. So just saying, just because we're not putting this regulation in place doesn't mean that all of a sudden there's gonna be a wave of people coming into our VRBOs and and, uh, and, and Airbnbs here. I think again it's just driven by the market. I'm not laughing at y'all. I just, I'm not even going to say it. It's just a dumb joke. What? From you? Yeah. I know a guy with a bunch of single beds in Ken's store. <laughs> They're long term ones. Um, anybody else with me here, Mr. O'Brien, have an opinion on that one? I, I, I could see it, at least switching it to adults. To adults. Yeah. Uh, like that's, I said, the only thing I'm consensus. thinking is if somebody has two beds in a room, you know, I don't know. Anyway. Why, why is it that the supposed liberal on the board here is the least restrictive when it comes to I'm still, business? I, I, I'm, I'm still trying to figure that, that out. out. <laughs> <laughs> nice nice you're going to support capitalism. Did he say something? <laughs> <liberal? laughs> I have been yeah. supporting it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so we hear adults. Is that what, yes. that's what the majority of two adults is? Right. Yeah, I'm comfortable with that. Okay. Yeah. Any, any other changes? Tony? I mean, I think that I think that addressed certainly the comments and some of the things the board. How about the? You did want to publish. I do have to ask one question. I do have to ask one question. 
let's suppose it's so just, bad that they got to pull out something. Is yeah, that guy's yeah. another bedroom? Nobody's going to be checking it. I mean, uh, let's go back <laughs> yeah, to what's kind of the point. It's like, guys, nobody's come up. There's nobody doing this. This is kind of, you know. All right. I think we're ready for How about, are we okay with the townhouses and duplexes? You have to be owner and it has to be your primary residence. Yep. To work around. Okay. Anything else before we uh, click out of the ordinance? Everybody done? Yep. You want me to make the motion? You've been sure. making the notes with the changes. All Go right. ahead and do it. Uh, this motion. Finding that the proposed zoning ordinance amendment is appropriate for public necessity, convenience, and general welfare and is good zoning practice. I move that the Board of Supervisors approve the amendments to the county code to amend sections 22-4-2.1 22 6 2.1, 22-7-9.1, 22-8-2.1, 22-22-1, and to enact 22-17-20 with amendments to section B, changing from 10 to 5 acres, and section I, changing the word persons to adults, and completely striking section D as listed. So. I'll, I'll, I'll second this one because he did a much better job of reading the numbers than Mr. Perry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was reading big print. I was reading small. All right. We have motion shared and seconded. <coughs> Hodge made a motion shared and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? The chair votes aye. Pass the final year. And we will move on to F. item F. Public hearing to amend sections 22-9-2.2, 22 22-10-4, 22 22-11-2.2, and 22-12-2.2 of the county code to make a clerical correction that minor scale solar generation facilities are allowed a special use permit in the B1, BC, I1, and I2 zoning districts. Mr. Whitney. Yes, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. So back in 2021, the zoning ordinance was amended to authorize small scale solar generation facilities as a by right use in the A1, R1, R2, R3, R4, B1, BC, I1, I2, and MHP zoning districts. But the ordinance mistakenly also authorized small scale solar generation facilities instead of minor scale solar generation facilities is a use allowed by special use permit in the B1, BC, I1, and I2 zoning districts. So a small scale solar generation facility is basically a system that produces no more than 15 kilowatts of electricity. So it's a pretty um, small scale. That's why um, it's allowed by right. And then if you look at the next definition, a minor scale solar generation facility is less than two megawatts of electricity so it's a little bigger. So that's why it makes sense that it would require a special use permit. So what the proposed ordinance would do is basically make the correction, uh, the mistake that was, correct mistake that was made in 2021 and would state that minor scale solar generation facilities are allowed by special use permit in the B1, BC, I1, and I2 zoning districts. And the Planning Commission did hold a public hearing and recommended approval of the ordinance. But happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Uh, open the public. Yep. Um, we will now have a public hearing. Please keep your comments to five minutes on topic and direct it to the board. Anybody have any comments or questions? Seeing none, the board, do you have anything else to no. discuss or questions? Yeah, close it. Seeing uh, none, I'll now close. With no one else, close public hearing. No questions or I think this makes perfect sense. And if the planning commission recommends it, I think we should do this. I'll make a motion. Finding that the proposed zoning ordinance amendment is appropriate for public necessity, convenience, and general welfare and is good zoning practice. I move that the Board of Supervisors approve the amendments to sections 22-9-2.2, 22-10-4, 22 11-2.2, and 22-12-2.2 of the county code. Second. Motion made by Mr. Goad, seconded by Mr. Hodge. All in favor say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? I didn't say aye, but I'm 
Did you say anything? I mean, it's just a change. I mean, we're going to, you know, change more things, so it doesn't matter right now. Okay. Um, so did everyone say I? I, 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 <laughs> sorry, could be say I, I did say I. Okay. <laughs> or you say just anybody opposed? <laughs> Chair votes on five zero. Super. Moving on to item G, public hearing to amend section 20-1-2.1 and to enact section 20-1-7 of the county code to strike optional penalty language and to give the treasurer discretion for application of tax payments when there is a payment arrangement. Mr. Wood. Yes, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. So basically Virginia code section 58.1-3916 states the penalty for failure to pay a tax shall not exceed 10% of the tax passed due or $10, whichever is greater, provided the penalty shall in no case exceed the amount of tax assessable. And there's also optional language in that same code section. So we discovered that on September 16th, 2020, the board actually already approved an amendment to section 20-1-2.1 that struck the optional language it states in the case of delinquent tangible personal property taxes more than 30 days past due, the penalty shall be 25% of the tax past due on such property. So if you owed a thousand dollars, it would be a $250 penalty. So now it'd be a you know, hundred dollar penalty. So the amendment was approved, but it was actually never codified. It was mistakenly, I think they thought it was a temporary ordinance on the person who was codifying the code. So basically now we will send that on to the uni code because that change has already been made. So the proposed amendment to section 20-1-2.1 would just add the language that the penalty shall in no case exceed the amount of the tax assessable. Yeah. And, and Virginia, so the other amendment is to section 20-1-7. And basically, Virginia Code Section 58.1-3913 states that unless otherwise provided by the board, any payment of taxes shall be credited first against the most delinquent amount. So the proposed code section would give discretion to the treasurer for the application of tax payments when there's a payment arrangement. So if someone wants to do a payment arrangement, they could credit that to the current year so they're not digging themselves in a deeper hole. So if the ordinance is approved, the treasurer could credit that payment to the recent amount due. So um, basically that what, basically the payment penalty and interest wouldn't continue to bill is the reason for this ordinance. Are there any questions? When we did this before, it just because it becomes more realistic penalty. They were protests, the penalty was really steep. That's why we decided to change it. And, and yeah. just as Mr. Witten said, it's this piece here in red, highlighted in red, that in your package was stricken Again, that was previously approved, but was never codified in, in, in the county's ordinance. And so really, so the update is, is the black bold piece to that, to, uh, to that section. Correct. Um, no, no, no. Public hearing. Okay. Public hearing. Well, open public hearing. Please keep your comments to five minutes on topic and directed to the board. Anybody have any comments? All right. Uh, seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Any other comments or anything? Or anybody want to make a motion? I move that the Board of Supervisors approve the amendments to the County Code to amend Section 20-1-2.1 and to enact Section 20-1-7 for a public hearing. Oh, be sorry, had. that's the wrong. I was going to say, we're, we're approving. Into an app. This, this was the public hearing. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just just take to, you can take out for a public hearing. Okay. Take out that yeah. last. Uh, to, enact to enact it on this meeting, March 20th, 2024. Second. All right, Mr. Sheridan made a motion, seconded by Mr. O'Brien. All in favor say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? World votes aye. Passes five zero. All right. So we're going to go back yeah, to action matters. Action matters. Um, item A. Advertisement of proposed fiscal year 2025 operations budget, yeah, tax rates, that. and capital improvement plan. Mrs. Milton? Well, let me do one thing here because this wasn't updated. Yes. Really? <laughs> There's a slot machine back there you guys <laughs> haven't discovered. Tax rates that are going to 
Okay. Oops. That's right. Oh, sorry. Wow. Just make, making the changes here. Personal property business facility will stay at 290 and machinery will be set for 90. Me. We already had comments. You want to make a motion? I will. I move the Board of Supervisors authorize staff to advertise the fiscal year 25 budget tax rates and capital improvement plan for the public hearing on April 10th, 2024. The proposed budget amount for fiscal year 25 is $109,232,910. The advertised tax rate are as follows. Real property, 84.4 per 100 of assessed value. Mobile homes, 84.4 per $100 of assessed value. Personal property, residential, 410 per 100. Personal property, business, and public utilities, 290 per 100. Machinery and tools, 190 per 100. One quick correction. I think you said 84.4. It should be 0.844. Yeah. Eight, oh, 0.844. Yeah. 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 Yes, I stand corrected. Real property, 0.844 per 100 assessed value, and mobile homes, 0.844 per 100 of assessed value. Eighty-four. We get, we, we get a lot of calls. <laughs> <laughs> Are we good? All right. Yes. Yeah, well, we good. need a second. Second. Okay. Mr. Hodges made a motion. Mr. Sheridan has made a second. I do have to ask one question. Should there be an S on the end of the rank? Yes. 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 Bam! I got an English correction. <laughs> Best force. That's why I stumbled when it was today. up. It was not grammatically yes. correct. Um, all right. We have a Most motion and a second. Are. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Uh, anybody opposed? Chair votes aye. Passes 5 0. Uh, we will move on to item B authorization to advertise, advertise for a public hearing to enact uh, section 20 1 8 of the county code to exempt from taxation certain classes of tangible. Personal property, Mr. Whitman. Yes, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Muni codes will be very busy of all these code amendments. <laughs> so, Virginia Code 58.1 3504 uh, gives optional authority to localities to exempt from taxation certain classes of household goods and personal effects. So, that's basically everything located within your house. Also, antique vehicles are included within this class. So, the Commissioner of Revenue has actually already been exempting such classes of property for over 20 years when I talked to him. It was just brought to his attention that the ordinance, according to our records, has never actually been adopted by the board, but it's optional language. So we actually have to have an ordinance um, adopting it. 58.1-3505 um, of the Virginia Code gives optional authority to localities to exempt from taxation certain classes of farm animals, grains, and feeds um, used for the nurture of farm animals, farm vehicles, machinery, implements, and equipment. So the Commissioner of Revenue has not been taxing cows or goats over the last 20 years. Some counties do. And nor does he want to. Nor does he want to. He's requesting this change. Uh, and so the ordinance was never previously been adopted. It's never been adopted as optional authority. So this board does need to adopt the ordinance to continue the exemption. We can make him go out and count chickens. Yep. Okay. Count heads of, heads of uh, chickens. And you goats. can include certain classes. So if you only want to make them count cows, but not goats, you could. Okay, right. Uh, so farm vehicles, farm yeah. machinery. I mean, how many nuggets are in the chicken machine. that's worth a lot of money? And I believe right now all that is exempt. It's exempt right now. It is exempt. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's been according to Mr. Sheridan, it's been exempt for the last over 20 years. For all farm winery equipment, that's all exempt. Okay. Under currently it's already been. And even going back to because the question I had was a classic car. If you have a car that has an antique plate on it, that's mm -hmm. it's exempt. And that's pretty common across our localities. My mom has her car from high school, a 1950 Jeepster. Doesn't pay taxes on it. <laughs> so it's pretty common across the state to exempt antique vehicles. But it is optional, so the board doesn't need to pass an ordinance. So the proposed amendment would enact Section 20-1-8, which would exempt all classes of property listed in those two code sections, 58.1-3504 and 58.1-3505. The public hearing would be held April 17th. But be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? I don't have any. 
I move that the Board of Supervisors advertise amendments to the County Code to enact Section 20-1-8 for a public hearing to be held April 17th, 2024. Second. Motion made by Mr. O'Brien, seconded by Mr. Sheridan. All in favor say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Chair votes aye. Passes 5-0. All right, we're moving on to item C, James River Water Authority Resolution Support Agreement and Service Agreement. Mr. Dahl. Yep, I'll, I'll give Dan a break on one here for, for the evening. <laughs> With my sore throat. <laughs> That's right. Um, so, so again, I'm not gonna go over all this stuff again. This is just showing you where the old route, uh, which was approximately mm -hmm. one mile, $9.7 million. The new route is four times the length. Project costs around $45.6 million. Um, again, this is just showing the overall project estimate of the items um, line one through 35 is the construction component of 39.687 million. And then another uh, um, amount of uh, cost for permitting property acquisition construction support services about 5.9. That's where the 45.6 million uh, project cost comes in. Um, so currently the GRWA has funding to get it through May, June, May slash June of 2024. The GRWA submitted a spring pool application to the Virginia Resource Authority. Um, some VRA loan conditions that must be satisfied prior to final pricing on April 15th in order to be included in the spring funding is one, uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers permit. Um, that, that process is going. We got comments back on Monday. The comments are minor. We are, we are ever so hopeful that we will, we will see that permit in time. In addition, um, a condition from VRA is all other required permits are, are also that are related to the project are also needed. So the county's local ENS permit, um, you know, any type of stormwater permits from DEQ, things like that would be needed as well prior to that April 15th deadline. In addition to that, um, providing evidence of the purchase of any wetland mitigation credits, stream credits, nutrient mitigation credits, and all other environmental uh, mitigation credits would also be necessary prior to that date. And we did push back on, uh, on VRA a little bit on this. They were a little stringent on us on this a little maybe more so than usual, but I think just with the with the with the history of the project, they want to make sure that everything is in place prior to pricing. Um, we, again, in the board package, you saw the saw the kind of the, the the general conditions that were that were submitted from the Virginia Resource Authority. So looking at estimated annual debt service for the project. So again, based on if, if, if the total ends up being around 49 million at a four and a half percent interest rate on 30 years, that total total annual debt service would be $3 million a year. That is that is for JR, JRWA, 50% of that is Luana's portion, 50% of that would be Louise's portion. Um, included in that is around 2.2 million of capitalized interest in fiscal year 25, roughly around a 3 million um, uh, local debt service reserve fund. And with those, the first debt service payment uh, would not take effect until fiscal year 26. Um, so one thing, if we do not get the required loan conditions by April 15th, uh, the JRWA will need to put out an RFP for interim financing through the, through the calendar year. This is certainly not not preferred, but we're trying to get everything done in time to get the to the to the funding through VRA. Um, and then again, if if we had to go the interim financing route, we would just put our our application would be there to ready to go for the summer pool. Um, so again, Fluvanna County resolutions uh, approving the financing uh, are, are before you today. Um, the Virginia Resource Authority requires all local approvals by March 22nd. Louisa, Louisa County had this on Monday. Their board voted um, uh, unanimously on this. Um, final pricing takes place on April 15th and the tentative closing to take place on May 15th. Um, so just a little thing about the documents in the package, you know, the resolution purpose um, really uh, will be condition, conditioning the member jurisdictions undertaking the non-binding obligations to appropriate from time to time monies to the, to the water authority in connection with payments due under the amendment to the <coughs> service agreement. Um, also, as part of this resolution, um, so, so it's being issued at a not to exceed debt total amount of 49 million 
and a not to exceed interest rate at 575, but the anticipated interest rate will be closer to four and a half percent. And the reason you put the slightly higher rate, and let's just say you put in 4.4% and it came in at 4.5%, you could not move forward with, with the financing because it exceeded that interest rate. Um, some other documents, the amended and restated support agreement. Again, um, it, it's a non it's a non binding obligation to appropriate such county debt service payments as may be requested from time to time, um, pursuant to the agreement to the fullest degree and in such manner that is consistent with the Constitution and laws of the Commonwealth. And basically, the, it recognizes that the board um, is not empowered to make binding commitments to such appropriations in future fiscal years, but it's basically stating its intent. Um, to do so and recommends future boards to do likewise. And then the, the, the uh, other third document, amendment to the service agreement, just outlines the JRWA and the counties agree to certain terms, conditions, covenants, and matters pertaining to the development and construction of the system. Um, and I'd be happy to answer questions that the board has. Questions? I think this is a must do. My only question would be, would we be better off to pay it in cash? In general, so. The interim? Y'all know the money stuff better than I do. Right? The only I thing know. is, well. Yeah, it's a fair question because I'm sure there's fees associated with taking out finance. Oh, the, yeah, there are. There's always yeah, fees. So, and, there's always fees with taking oh, out yeah, issuing yeah, debt yeah, service. You're talking about a month. Yeah. Why, yeah. why go through the process of financing? Keep you sweet. Well, the, so, so the problem is, I mean, from the financing piece, again, the, the actions before you is for the final financing. That's, that's what this is. If for some reason that those items, those permit items are not available until April 15th, this, these agreements are basically, they basically go away um, because, because we're not going into this pool because right. we didn't meet those conditions of the loan. Right. Um, so if that comes forward, the JRWA would go out for interim financing. I think, I think yes, to, to, to go back and answer your question, there is an opportunity for both, both boards potentially to put in funding for interim financing if they want, if, if we do not, if for some reason we don't meet the conditions by April 15th for, for the permanent financing. So I think that's something I could bring back to the board well, I'm guessing you, you, you could see, you know, fees 10, 15, 20,000 or more. Probably more than that, but yeah. Yeah. So I mean, it's like, okay, why are we paying that? Yeah. I mean, so, so the board could, I mean, so for that to do in, instead of doing the interim financing, the board or boards flew in and yeah, Louisa, we'd, have to, we'd have to do it together then. Yeah. Yes. They would, they would have to want to be able to do funding funding it cash funded too. Now the thing you could, we could do potentially, which, which we did speak about is there are things called reimbursement resolutions. So let's just say that June 1st, let's just say we're all out of funds and we started both boards appropriated funds for the interim piece. There's something called a reimbursement resolution where both counties could get reimbursed for those funds that they put up, which would be part of the final which would be part of the, the summer pool that we entered into. So that is always an option. Again, we're trying to go forward and go for final, but if for some reason, which we are hoping we do, we hit all these, hit all the necessary things by April 15th, um, I would come back to the board and, 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 you know, see if you wanted to do something different. Sure. I still just, I, I still, I asked this question last week. Yep. Um, just, I hate to finance it. When we know, well, we don't know for sure, but hopefully we're being reimbursed. And that eats up a big chunk of the reimbursement if we're paying ten million dollars for finance yeah. over thirty years or whatever. I mean, it's not too, usually after a couple of years, there's not too many prepayment penalties. And, uh, uh, the JWA, okay. but you know, we'll have other things that we'll maybe take that reimbursement from. Yeah, I guess so. That, that's my only hesitation. Yeah. I mean, what is that, I guess the question on that would be, you know, are we reimbursed based on the on the on the payment costs, or are we reimbursed based on the total amount? 
you're yeah, reimbursed just... on cost, but there is an there's there's a hiccup on that right now. There's yes, one they don't have approvals, I mean, Dominion, and secondly, there's something I want to talk to Dan about, which is about pursuing funding their their funding stream from a different angle. Right. From a yeah. fund, from a potential debt service angle. And and so there's been some back and forth on that, but um but but anyway. But so and so cost the the actual cost for the year. So if you're doing financing, you know, on that three million a year, you know, that you're paying, then presumably it's a, it's being paid back at one and a half million dollars as opposed to a upfront charge. I, I think I, I think I'm miss, I think I'm missing you on something here. So I think what Mr. Sheridan was saying was that if we would ultimately get reimbursed by Dominion for the JRWA, yep, right, would they take the approach if we have it financed, right, that they're going to reimburse the you know let's say the t the total cost is forty nine million dollars, yep. our share is twenty four and a half million dollars. Yep. Would they give us twenty four and a half million dollars, or would they give us uh, one and a half million dollars that we're paying year one, one and a half million dollars that we're paying year two? So, so what the proffer language says is, is we'll reimburse on actual, and I don't have it right for me. I think actual like invoices as we right. pay out. I think as we pay out construction costs. Now, I think there is an angle that maybe could be made that okay. So, say you take out debt service. Now, I don't think. Let's see. If you took out the debt service, I don't think the interest could be considered actual cost. But could the principal amount that you took out to pay for the project could that be considered actual costs of the project? Yeah. So there is there's some. I mean, presumably we would want we would want to be paid upfront as opposed to being paid on an actual basis. It's it would it's 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 a reimbursement basis. You're not being paid upfront. You're being paid when the cost is being put. Yes. In. So I'm just saying, and, know, and, and, and right now, financing over 20 years and 30, you know, 30, 30 years, right? Then, and, and, as and, opposed and, to it being completed in three years, there's still a big difference, right? Well, yeah. And, and, and the issue is right now, I've, I've made multiple attempts to my representative with Dominion and, and I've been getting crickets. Hmm. Well, we can always pull that special session. use permit. It might be a closed session topic. <laughs> the board reserves the right to remove the special use permit. I think that might get attention. Sorry. This, I'm, sorry I'm sorry, guys. What I'm talking about is I don't want to use up everything that they're giving us paying for financing. Yeah, I don't understand. When, when they're supposed to be paying us back as we pay. And, and, and again, the only thing with the Dominion money, remember the Dominion money is for the is is, is for a lot of water projects. Yeah, and correct, but I don't want to use all up on one. Uh, especially before we get it get it back down my way. Well, well, no, I mean, but but I guess that's that's the thing. I mean, you can only use so much of the project for for this one, and and, and the large majority of it is for the Fork Union water supply project. Okay. That's what the largest is. There a <clears throat> set amount. That can't be exceeded for the first portion of it. So, so the way the way it works is is the way the proffer was written. There was there was an amount specified to the JRWA, and it was roughly seven point six million. There was uh, there was a, a a pocket called unanticipated costs that was roughly around eleven million and some change. I think the 11 million and some change gives the county wiggle room to use it for how, what project they feel they need it to go for. And then the remainder between that 17 and the 47 million for water stuff, basically there's 30 million that's earmarked specific to the Fork Union water supply project. So that's, that's kind of how it's all broken out. All righty. I move that the Board of Supervisors approve the resolution entitled Resolution Approving the Execution and Delivery of an Amended and Restated Support Agreement for James River Water Authority. For the James River Water Authority and further authorize the County Administrator to execute the support agreement entitled Amended and Restated Support Agreement, James River Water Authority, and a service agreement entitled Amendment to Service Agreement, subject to the County Attorney's approval as to form. Second. Motion made by Mr. O'Brien, seconded by 
Mr. Hodge, all in favor say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Board votes aye. Uh, zero. Passes five zero. All right. Uh, moving on to D. item D, amendments to the county code for small scale, minor scale, and utility scale solar generation facilities. Mr. Whitman. Yes, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. So at the board meeting on March 6, the board approved a resolution of intention to amend section 22-4-2.2 to remove utility scale solar generation facilities as a use allowed by special use permit in the A1 zoning district. So in accordance with the zoning code, the board can adopt this resolution and then the resolutions refer to the planning commission and the planning commission would then need to hold a public hearing before providing the recommendation to the board. So at the, there's a copy of the ordinance, what it would, what it would look like basically, this is striking through utility scale solar generation facilities as a use allowed. So the planning commission did consider this at March 12th and um, they said that basically they wanted some time to talk to staff, talk to the community, um, and staff had discussed, should we have a timeline basically for the planning commission to hold the public hearing and send the recommendation to the board? So a timeline of time, 90 days was suggested just for this amendment to remove the use. Uh, for the supplemental regulations, we discussed 180 days. Um, I thought... I thought um... I thought we discussed 60 days and then 90 to the, they'd put it at 90 to the board. Well, basically Mr. Dahl and I were discussing 60 days might be a little tight with the planning commission, having a work session, then having a public hearing. It'd be tight that 60 day window. So that's what Actually we wanted to give. Actually getting it to the board. Would be that's tight. what we wanted to give a little leeway. Okay, um, but, we, but we didn't discuss 90 days. I'm, I'm okay with it, but I'm yeah, just saying. Sorry. I said, so I was saying staff. Yeah, I should yeah. have said Mr. Dahl yes. and I discussed after yes. discussing it with you, we okay. discussed pushing it to yeah. 90 days um, because basically we're worried about the timeline getting it to the board um, because the planning commission is going to hold another work session first. We're not planning to advertise the public hearing at the April meeting. It would go to the planning commission at the May meeting for a public hearing and then they would make a rec recommendation or they could defer it. So this gives them the chance also if they want to defer it one month to then make a recommendation. So it just gives a little more wiggle room. But if the board wants it to be 60 days, I mean, we can do 60 days. No, we need to get them in the motion. Because well, definitely their recommendation that they have is ample time possible to have these discussions. So yeah. I'm yeah, I'm good with 90. I just think somebody so should have mentioned it to me if that's where we were. Yeah. And Yeah, I I apologize. I, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll take the I'll take the hit on that one. So at the board meeting on March six, we the board also adopted a resolution to enact twenty two dash seventeen dash twenty one to add supplemental regulations for small scale, minor scale, and utility scale solar generation. Same thing, the planning commission would need to hold a public hearing before <laughs> providing the recommendation. So for this one, we had discussed one hundred and eighty days basically would be the timeline to hold a public hearing and send a recommendation to the board. And for this one, the planning commission said they definitely need more time to consult with the community, maybe have a community meeting, a Q and A type meeting, and also, um, you know, look at other um, localities. I had showed them the Albemarle, the Louise and the um, Lancaster ordinances, but they said they want more time to just look at it. So that's what we suggest 180 days for that one to come back with a recommendation. So the other question, is there any questions on that? Uh, I'm, I'm like commenting. So the other question that came up from the planning commission was basically, what do we do with the existing applications? Um, you know, we had CEP solar that came to the planning commission in November and it was deferred. Now it's deferred to June um, for the planning commission to make a decision. So um, basically under the state code, the board has to make a decision within 12 months of that first initial public hearing, unless C White Oak Solar, CEP Solar, agrees to defer it out further. Now, White Oak Solar did say they're willing to work with the county on the supplemental regulations. I mean, obviously, if it was removed as a use in the A1, the project can't come to fruition. So, obviously, they're only willing to work with the county if, you know, we were going to just amend the supplemental regulations, basically. Mm -hmm. So the board does have to make a decision within 12 months to act upon the application under the state code. So what we, when staff discussed it, we discussed 
six months, basically, we would not, the board wouldn't consider any applications um, before this board. But to give a little more, next slide, please. A little more time, we thought about why don't we say until the second meeting of October, because it ha a decision has to be made by this board by the November meeting to fit within that 12 month um, timeline. So that's actually seven months would give time basically where the board would give a decision. Now, obviously if, if um, the use is no longer allowed in the A1 and we're not, and the board doesn't grandfather existing applications, that, that kind of all depends on how that ordinance is um, approved by the board. So, um, so basically the delay would give the planning commission and the board time to consider all the amendments to the county code. Are there any uh, questions about the motions or the resolution? So did, now did this include um, a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The, you, 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 you're looking for the word moratorium. moratorium. So we, yeah. I did a little re more research on moratorium because that's what um, I believe is Halifax County had done a moratorium. And I tried to find it on their website, couldn't find the resolution, but I did a little more research and I don't believe what they did had legal authority. Um, I don't think they can do a blanket, just moratorium. What you can do is take advantage of the fact that you have 12 months to consider an application. So you can delay the decision while you're amending your code, but you can't just do a blanket moratorium. So after researching it further, I basically, I think what Halifax did, I don't think that meets the Virginia code. So under Dillon rule, I don't think they had the authority to issue that blanket moratorium um, at their meeting. And, and really the reason going back to the seven months is that goes back to, to, to White Oak, basically, that'll be up to their technically 12 months since since they um, submitted or was it submitted right. or since well, it's, the it's when the public hearing. So yeah, I talked to hearing. Harry Kingery with White Oak Solar and we both agreed it would be the public hearing is when the 12 months starts. So we had talked about this in January when they were first deferring or maybe it was December when they were first deferring. And we both agreed that the 12 month period started at the public hearing. So would motion happened. one just apply to CEP or would that apply to any, I mean, I guess. So same, let's say Pine Gate applied right, right now. It's not even on the agenda, Yeah. but let's say they apply. They want to come in May. Then basically if the public hearing was in May, the board would have 12 months to, you know, basically approve or deny that application. But, but that, let's say it came up next month or was through the planning commission next month and then, you know, to us, would, would that also fall into the October timeframe as well? No. Okay. No. It would go longer. I mean, again, they could still apply to the planning commission, yeah. but it would be the 12 months from the planning from the commission, commission public hearing for the board to make their decision. So what this, this delays any board decisions basically until October um, of next of this year. Yeah. Should be clear, these are three separate resolutions here. There's three separate motions. So motions, um, yeah. Yeah. basically you can um, approve any or all of the resolutions. But there are three separate items. You know, the first one deals with basically existing applications and future applications. And then the second and third deal with the ordinance amendments that the planning commission is considering and basically um, putting a timeline on the planning commission to give a recommendation. How does the first motion address that? I'm, I'm... The first motion basically, um, if you go to that resolution. Yeah. So basically what that resolution says is to give time for the planning commission to consider the ordinance amendments. Basically the board will not hear any applications until the second meeting in October. We're not holding any public hearings. And again, this, applications. this goes back to the question of can the county do a moratorium? You can't do a moratorium, but you can delay it to a certain point to go through and, and get the proper regulations in place. Correct. Not sure if they're proper. You yeah. can get regulations in no. place. The chosen, chosen, chosen regulations. Chosen regulations. And it was, and it was the planning commission that wanted to do the moratorium, right? Planning Commission discussed it and basically what can we do? And so that was the topic of moratorium came up because Halifax County had done it the week prior okay. and it was in the newspapers. I think it's really important that we get these regulations in place. I went out to that Palmer solar place for the second brush fire and there was growth from the previous year that was dead that fed the fire. 
and the damage from the first fire hadn't even been repaired. The screening was down. There was some serious issues. If we had to go between the panels at midday when they were down, we wouldn't have got a brush truck between them. So spacing, screening, the amount of time that we give them to repair, the requirements to keep the vegetation down, because the fuel load in there was huge. And had it taken off more than what it was, we could have had a huge fire. And there was, there was the damaged panel from the previous time that they hadn't even fixed. And there was wires down from other panels. So you'd think when the solar generation went down that they would have come out and attempted to fix it. That's money just being thrown away. But they just didn't seem that bothered, which kind of falls in line with what some people were saying. You know, they're just putting it in to make money and they really don't care after that. And it worried me slightly to think <clears throat> that what's it going to look like when it's no longer generating them money? So we do need... How are they going to dispose of it? What are the bonds going to be? What's the spacing going to be like? What's the maintenance of the facility, the screening, the vegetation? We need to get those rules in place. Yeah, I don't question that at all as far as regulations in terms of you know what we should look for. I wonder if, what is the benefit, because let's be frank, if we put this in I-1 only, and now I-1 with a special use permit, um, which we, by definition, are then saying it's only going to be in industrial zoned areas, which is exactly where we really don't want this because that's our commercial areas that we're applying stuff. They were essentially saying we're just not going to allow solar in this county. Um, and, you know, I think the discussion matter is, you know, down to, you know, what, how the, you know, the board votes, of course, but also how the community perceives this. Um, you know, I think that that these probably both of these things should happen within the same time frame, not within separate time frames. Because again, I said it last time, I don't see the purpose of regulations when you've already pretty much done an outright ban. Um, and I don't know that dividing this up into two different hearings um, really gives the public the full knowledge and scope of what is being asked. Um, certainly there are people that are going to be in favor of it. And certainly there are going to be people who are not going to be in favor of it. I think these should be considered at the same time. <clears throat> so I would recommend that they both be 180 days <clears throat> is my recommendation. I, um, I respectfully disagree that they're not bolted together. Um, I don't, I don't see any tie that keeps them together and there's nothing about this particular uh, about the a one portion that would take six months for them to review. Um, so I wouldn't see any reason to hold Not off on that. that. And if there's protections that do come from that, then I wouldn't want those protections holding just because they're randomly tied to the, um, to our policies. My point wasn't, so much the planning commission's ability to review it as much as the public's ability to review and see the two hand in hand. That was really my point there. Because I think that there is confusion among the public thinking that, you know, we're doing something about solar. Some may or may not recognize that motion number one is pretty much an outright ban of solar and can be confused with motion number or motion number two it's an outright ban of solar. And motion number three is essentially saying we're going to put regulations. You may have a lot of the public in place that is in favor of the regulations, myself included, but not in favor of the putting the, uh, of eliminating the use in agricultural uh, with a special use permit. So that's my concern is that I think we're muddling the issues with the public, not the planning commission's ability to review. <clears throat> and that when I started to say something, I was going to say what um, Tim had said that you know there's certain things that are dangers that we just don't know about. And um, one of them was when those panels are out, do we have enough room to get our equipment through there to fight a fire? Because literally, we had I was doing behind the wheel with a little girl that literally lived like, backed up to the fence every day yep. when I left her driveway. Um, we need to be able to get there to fight it. But then when you get there, 
you got to be careful that you don't get electrocuted because you can't cut them off. No, those, I mean, those, I mean, chief, the chief raised great points on that. I thought that was, you know, excellent. It again, lends itself to why we, the planning commission should review the ordinances that we put in place and make recommendations. I don't disagree with that at all. I don't think that if somebody puts in, you know, um, how, whatever the cost is, and Mr. Putnam had said half a million dollars per acre. I don't know if that's accurate or not, but I can't imagine that anybody who's making that investment wants it to go up in flames either. So, you know, I, I would think that, that, mm. you know, they're still looking for the ability to make sure they get the revenue. And by the way, you know, more than likely is the fact that the solar panels are replaced with newer and more efficient solar you, panels. You would hope so. Cycle. Yeah. But, but I mean, by the same token, there's a saying of friction fire. So as it ages, the insurance policy starts rubbing up against the cost. Poof. Right. And they write it off as an insurance thing and replace it. Possible. Yeah. My my inclination would actually be to, to probably keep the 90 and extend the 180 closer to, I guess I don't know how much closer you could get with with the with that 180 days. Um, Why don't we let but extend? I mean, it doesn't within a I, month after that we have to make a decision. Is it within yeah. a month? Okay, because my my thought process was it doesn't take. I, I don't think it <clears throat> because of the way the meetings fall and things like that. I mean, they can have a conversation and, and discuss, and they already were having great conversation about these two separate items um let them make a decision on the first on this on this on the um on the i guess it's the second one on here but really the third first motion that we're talking about with days i don't think you need 90 days to de determine whether or not it's a zta and if ultimately you know they send us something and it's their recommendation is to not remove the special use permit request and they can subsequently or even if before then i mean this says minimum 90 days so they could make a decision sooner and then if their request is not they can start working on okay now what do those ordinances look like because we have sent them two separate things um but if their request is not then we should be taking the vote if our if our decision is yes we're going to put it in industrial then it really begs the question why are we asking them to look at regulations well then i think it makes it well abandoned. I think it makes sense to make maybe make that sixty and make them come up with a. a, a maybe yeah, I think I think it, it 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 is as confusing to the public, and that's the point is that there are I guarantee you if you have conversations there are plenty of people that won't know that these are two different issues, but they will say oh yeah we need to regulate it. I mean the reason you have to put the regulations in place is one because the planning commission could say I think you should allow it in a one. We could restrict it in a one, and the state could in the next session take the legislation up that they've tabled and say, well, you guys can't do that. And it's allowed in A1 and we're caught without the regulations in place. And at some point in the future, we could say, well, actually we think our regulations are robust enough that we should allow it in A1. <clears throat> so, I mean, this kind of puts it to the planning commission, gives us room to breathe, puts the regulations in place, and then we can see what happens from there. I mean, there's a lot of paths this could take going forward. I think your point is a good point. I still think the confusion point is still relevant. You know, then you're by, by separating these two things out there, you you may be getting two different things. Yeah. So the reason why we can what well, sixty days would be tough is when we look to the yeah. calendar, that means the public public hearing. hearing would have to be in April because yeah. of where the planning commission yeah. falls. Because the May months. meeting is the um, the seventh. So that was why we said sixty days. <coughs> be, and that's why we said ninety, 90 days. days. It's just only tough with the timeline. At the minimum, at the minimum. Yeah. I mean, the Planning Commission, anytime we re remand something down to them, they can always come back and say, hey, we tried to do this in this time. Can you give us 30 more days? Yeah, I, I couldn't see anything in that that would, I don't know what they'd work on that would take them 90 days to no. analyze that or pay one piece of if it. If they get to work with the public and decide they need more time to understand more people because they're going to be the ones that are dealing with it yeah. not us well i agree with that in the, in the in the other piece creating creating the ordinances and they can always come back and ask we can say no um i mean if they ask i think we should do everything we can to oblige them yes and allow them to have the time i'm happy with them the way they are i do think we need to proceed Uh, I'll make the first. Is it three separate? There's three separate motions. Yes. 
I move that the Board of Supervisors approve the resolution regarding consideration of applications by the Board of Supervisors for minor scale and utility scale solar generation facilities. Second. Motion made by Mr. Goad, seconded by Mr. Hodge. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? I'm against because I think we're changing the rules on people midstream. So that's why I'm against it. Chair votes aye, passes 4 1. I move that the Board of Supervisors request the Planning Commission make a recommendation to the Board of Supervisors within 90 days on the ordinance to amend section 22-4-2.2 of the County Code to remove utility scale solar generation facilities as a use allowed by special use permit in the Agricultural A1 Zoning District. Second. Motion made by, made by Mr. Goad, seconded by Mr. Hodge. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. Chair votes aye, passes four to one. I move that the Board of Supervisors request that the Planning Commission make a recommendation to the Board of Supervisors within 180 days on the ordinance to enact section 22-17-21 to add supplemental regulations for small scale solar genera generation facilities, minor scale solar generation facilities and utility scale solar generation facilities. Second. Motion made by Mr. Goad, second by Mr. Hodge. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? Chair votes aye, passes 5-0. Next to the consent agenda. Anybody have anything you want to pull? Uh, make a motion we adopt the consent agenda as second. Motion made by Mr. Sheridan to adopt, second by Mr. Hodge. All in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Board uh, chair votes aye, passes 5 0. All right. Any unfinished business? Um, new business. I, I just want to update because of, of a, the earlier conversation about the schools. Um, one of the things we talked, uh, Eric and I met with uh, the schools this morning, and a good idea that came up was for CIP items that we start in January meeting at a different CIP location. So, for example, the two tracks. January would meet at one, February would meet at the next, and then the, maybe the bathrooms. On I got plenty of pictures of the one to middle school if you want me to show them to you. Like right. I said, I've been saying, uh, and we should. We yeah, should. and I've seen yeah. it. Yeah. This is just one of those things. I've said it for five years. I'm just glad that we're finally addressing it. Because guys, I'm yeah. telling you right now, it's a miracle. We haven't had a child yeah. either. Well, that's rough. Yeah, and even if you don't do that, then, you know, certainly it's like, Video presentation or whatever. Yes. Yeah. Use, well, um, and like I said, having the discussion because it was myself, uh, Mr. Fairchild, uh, Dr. Gretz, and then um, uh, Mr. Key and Mr. Reed. They were they took part today, and so we were talking about for like the next budget year, really starting in January when we do the kind of the, um, uh, you know, kind of the joint meetings, just meeting at a different school location, and then you know if there's something we want to see, we can go and kind of take pick looks of the of the different locations to kind yeah. of see the conditions. I was pleased, Mr. Kelly reached out to me and then made all of the arrangements to get us in the get me in the facilities to see firsthand. I've never. Anytime you want to come to the middle school, uh, I know somebody's got a key. It's well, good to see it, it firsthand. This all came up because a um, school board member asked if asked me if I knew if any other board members other than yourself had seen these tracks. And I, I didn't. Seven so. years ago. That the track, the issues with the high school track started two years after we, it started popping already because of the, and the drainage is not good. Yeah. Well, there's, yeah. There, there's issue with the drainage and that started popping a little bit like the third year we were there. And now it's got spots coming up, but I'm telling you guys, Coach yeah. Carter, God bless him. The only reason we've survived is he goes out there on his own and tries to patch that track all the time. And he, yeah, the middle, the middle school track. On, yeah, the middle school track. I mean, it's like I said, we looked down the other day and the guy, my buddy that I teach with, goes, man. The shingles are blowing off the roof. It's a dude that ain't a shingle. It's a piece of track about the size mm -hmm. of the shingle. The wind had blown off. Um, and then a, just another quick item for us to, and I think, I know Eric and I've talked and maybe Dan 
too about the um yeah then also about the uh the building on 53 the large farm uh building that's being built i uh, asked uh, about uh, that whether that uh, went through uh, a trc because that, that looked industrial is that the one by Ms. Yeah, Ms. Moore. I think it has an ag uh, exemption is what i've heard so i'm as you can imagine being in my district since we've talked about it, i'm getting a lot of people asking me about it and um my concern is that we don't have clarity that I can see after we talked of how many bales of hay do you have to put in to a building for it to be ag. And so you have Dusty Christian who went through everything he did to put his building in down Lake Monticello Road. That it looks to me is smaller than this one out in the Way field. smaller. And I'm not giving these people a hard time. They did what they had the right to do. But um again they're gonna have dusty's gonna have his equipment in there these people are in the earth moving business they're gonna have some of their equipment in their farm building how do we make dusty go through all this and i just don't see the i'm not sure where the lines are to yeah, i think the building official makes the determination after hearing the evidence whether it's ag use or where the ag exemption applies but um I mean, if they ever use it like for for business a purpose. business purpose off site, yeah. and no ag, the ag exemption doesn't apply, yeah. and they'd have to get a permit and they'd have to get a change of use. So, so they, let's say they have a contracting business and they go off site, they'd have to get a change of use for that. What if the board said no to them? Well, then they can't do that. Yeah, I mean, you'd have to look at, in that zone yeah. for a contractor storage yard that requires a special mm -hmm. use permit, right? Yeah. In a one. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm, I'm yeah. So basically, the change of use will require a special use permit for that contractor storage yard. Huh? So then it'd have to come through the planning commission. So if there was evidence they weren't were using it not just store round bales and tractors, but to store, you know, Mack trucks and excavators, then yeah, they would have to come back for a contractor storage. <clears throat> and, and, and again, with this too, I would I would gather that you probably have businesses around the county that are operating different things, whether it's yeah from a repair shop to other things that are probably not in the correct zoning or didn't go through the correct, <clears throat> the correct process for, for, for what they're doing right now. So there are a lot of guys with small earth moving businesses and plumbing businesses and so on that are completely licensed and have a barn that they do farm stuff with and they pull their piece of equipment in there too. So are we saying that every one of those is in violation? No. It depends on the level of the use. You know, are they, I mean, it's kind of a determ reasonable person determination by the building official, whether that really falls under ag use or not. Because basically, if they don't agree to get the SUP, we'd be taking them to court. So we'd have to prove to a judge they need an SUP. This is not an ag exemption. So it's kind of an analysis <laughs> whether it falls under contract or storage or it falls under ag exemption. And I think wasn't Mr. Williams also doing some sort of storefront as well, too? Is, is that the same? Mr. Williams. The, the, the one on Dusty. Lake Montiel Road. Oh, Dusty. Yeah. He, oh, yeah. No, so I don't believe so. No. Sort of, no. No, no. His no, just, just equipment. It's it's just equipment. equipment. I, I think the buildings are stolen right the equipment and then to maybe work on the equipment. I, I maybe mean, he stores the equipment building. behind Ace Hardware now. There, there is an yeah. administration yeah. building or something. No, I don't think so. Uh, really? Well, which one? Which, which, which well, one do you think so? Uh, this is the Amazon one on Lake Center. Monticello Road. Um, when oh, you're no, going down 53, it's on the Lake Monticello Road. You're thinking behind Road, Food Lion. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is the yeah, one across from the store. Yeah, it's on the Lake Monticello Road. Gotcha. It seems loose to me, and and maybe there's no better way, but if it's up to the discretion of one person and it, it looks to me like we go back to how one person is treated compared to another. Well, I shouldn't say one person, also the zoning administrator. Because mm. the zoning administrator from the zoning angle could say no, that requires the SUP. So you have, a, you have the building side and the zoning side that are both looking at it. But solely up to their discretion. Yes. I mean, yeah, they have authority under the zoning and building code to make that determination. Well, I'm just, again, I was just, 
what I had imagined was some sort of clear in writing, I don't know if ordinance is the word or what, but something clearly showing um, what qualifies and what doesn't. I, to me, like, like in this case, what are, so let's say he does start storing his equipment that he uses in his business and that's the business he's in, the, the building's up. There's no, uh, there's no process or uh, what are we going to do then? Because we take we can take him to court and fine him for illegally using the building, or we can file an injunction and say you're not allowed to use the building because yes. that use is not allowed. So we have tools, we have enforcement tools, um, you know, to stop that use. If he's taking his equipment off site on a daily basis, and suddenly that becomes a question mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a it's going to be a tough situation because a building that big. What do we, I mean, and, and right, I'm looking on in the A1 code section. And I don't see contractor storage or as a special use permit. So it might also require a text amendment to allow that to A1 as a use. Allow that special it, use. Is permit. it just an investor then? Is it just I1? Maybe B1 as well. I1 and I2, yeah. So is it allowed by right then because it's not specifically excluded? No, no, no. no. The way our warrants raised, if it's not listed, no, it's not allowed. It's not allowed. Yeah. So you feel comfortable there's not gray area there? I mean, I can drive out and look at it. I haven't looked at it in a few weeks since they're first building it. Yeah, it's I've, massive. I've received complaint. My brother-in-law complained to me about it. So it's I mean um, it's it's a good sized building. But I know I've talked to Andy about it because he's had her I told Mr. Well. Goat I thought it was the Amazon data center and we were gonna get some money. But I mean I can talk to the zoning administrator and building official and say let's the three of us go out there and look at it. And again, I'm not trying to the building's coming up. You know, I'm not trying to go after them. I'm just trying to help prevent potentially the same in the future. I mean, could we not have an ordinance that says that speaks to square footage? Um, yeah, I mean, ag exemption, there's no maximum square footage. You can build um, a big I mean, pink barn if you want to, as big as you like. Sounds like yeah, it. I mean, you think a turkey barn, how big that is. Yeah, uh, but I mean, look, so basically contractor storage yards are allowed by right in the I-2 um by special use permit in the b1 um, so there are a lot of others in the district so it would require a text amendment as well but i can talk to the building official tomorrow about it speaking of uh new business and zoning text amendments um since we just put in place the uh, short-term rental one and we talked about having an sup could you look at that and make sure we have the sup exemptions yeah mm -hmm. yeah oh uh, this is not a new business. I should have said it earlier. Last week, I brought up the thing about our kids going down to the mansion last weekend. And uh, I don't know about all of them. Two of them, one of them, make sure I knew about it. One of them was riding with our boys' four by 800 meter relay team, finished third out of 21 teams at the Nationals. And this isn't the whole nation represented, but these are teams coming from all over the East Coast. Um, and then Young lady is going to be running for Longwood next year. Ms. Sophie Bartley finished fourth, I believe, in the thousand. So we, you know, I, I don't know if we can do something just to recognize them or something. If some, if a kid does something national to be recognized, it's probably not a bad thing. Yeah. What will we do? I don't know. I mean, we have a resolution. We, do a, we have a resolution recognizing. Yeah. Maybe recognize. We do it for legal scouts. Of that nature. Huh? We do it for Eagle Scouts, yeah. and I mean national level. Yeah, that's pretty significant. That's pretty impressive. All right, I'm down. I'm done. I just I'm had one item. I wanted to thank Mr. Dahl and the finance team for the hard work that they've done getting the budget to where we're at today. Amen. I appreciate well, it. The, yeah. the, them, the schools, everyone. Yeah. I mean, everybody's really tried to work for the most part to get to where we are, and. Believe it or not, in spite of the little bit of bad news we got today, it's good news. It is. Because it's tax relief for our citizens. I'm going to open up our second round of public comment. Anybody wishing to address the board to come to the podium, state your name and address. Please remember to keep your comments to five minutes on topic and direct it to the board. Anybody wish to come to the podium? Susie, you looked like you were getting up. I was <laughs> <laughs> You're good. I, don't know that I, say I hear you. Yes, ma'am. 
<laughs> In that case, seeing none, seeing none, we'll close the second round of public comments. Um, and uh, Mr. Chair, I move the Fanatic yeah. County Board of Supervisors and Newman to a close meeting pursuant to the provisions of Section 2. Uh, two dot, let's see. Uh, 2.2-3711A1, um, 2.2-3711A5, 2.2-3711A7, um, and yeah, we still have to do 2.2-3711A8 of the Code of Virginia 1950 as amended. For the purposes of discussing employees of the Public Works Department under personnel, prospective industry, prospective business updates in the Columbia, Cunningham, and Fort Union District, Litigation Gate Plaza and the Chamber of Commerce Agreement under legal matters. Second. Motion made by Mr. O'Brien, seconded by Mr. Sheridan. All in favor? Aye. aye. Anybody aye. against? Board votes aye. Pass 5 0.
Okay. Are you ready? Ready? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Ready? Yep. Yep. Mr. Chair, I move the closed meeting be adjourned. And the Flavana County Board of Supervisors convene again in another session. Be resolved, the Board of Supervisors does hereby certify to the best of each member's knowledge when only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements under Section 2.2 3711A of the Code of Virginia 1950 is amended. And two, only such public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened were heard, discussed, or considered in the meeting. Second. Motion made by Mr. O'Brien, seconded by Mr. Sheridan. All in favor? Yep. Uh, uh, roll call. Mr. Hodge says aye. Mr. Good says aye. You're Mr. supposed Sheridan to call his says name. Aye. The dude says aye. <laughs> <laughs> The chair says aye. The regular is five zero. Motion to adjourn. Caitlin. Second. Caitlin's like, Caitlin's like, Caitlin's like, Motion made by Mr. Sheridan, second by Mr. Hodge. All in favor? Aye. aye. All opposed? Chair votes no. Pass the four to one.